Hey there, audiobook enthusiasts. Welcome to the audiobook collection. Today's upcoming audiobook is a special shout out to one of our amazing Patreon backers. If you're keen on personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. The link is in the video description below. Your support is truly appreciated, and I'm grateful to have you with me on this exciting audiobook adventure. And hey, if you're looking for a bundle of 300 plus novels, swing by my Kofi shop. For just $35, you can snag a Google Drive link to an audiobook treasure trove. Additionally, if you want to show some love to the original author of this novel, check out the author's credits discreetly provided in the description. Your support makes a difference. Thanks for being part of this literary journey with me. Chapter 26 Soul Music is my favorite. I fly off into the sky after killing the cute mage girl and fly towards the city. I turn into Big Bob and screech out loudly, letting my fake anger be known. I fly above the city and let my magic yules be known. The people shiver in fear as my power level right now is a little bit below Charybdis, but I've got intelligence on my side. I start launching missiles at the city and using the gravity beams to rip it apart. I don't do much damage compared to that alien world, because of the fact that every single thing has magic yules in it that strengthen it to incredible levels. Clay from this world would be able to stop a nuke on Earth. Speaking of nukes, I wanna kill and eat that one mage guy to get that magic. It seems useful. I see a group of humans running out of the city in a big crowd and send a giant ray of atomic breath to turn them from a solid to a gas. I see a human with a shield surrounding them and wonder if I can get that skill if I eat them. I scoop up the shielded person and throw them in my mouth. Human mage DNA, 1%. Magicules gained, 475, 233,748. Ability gained. Shield, turn your energy into a shield that surrounds whatever you want it to. Nothing can enter or leave said shield. Ho ho. This will be useful. I set up a shield around the entire city and start turning biovolcanic to raise the temperature. The ability also said that nothing can enter or escape, meaning I could just burn the oxygen in the air and choke any remaining humans out without having to resort to the nuclear pulse and destroy the surrounding landscape. I think that would make Guy get angry. It takes a few hours, but I successfully turned the inside of the shield into a vacuum. All humans within it suffocate and die within minutes. Souls gained, 41,738, 78,015. Damn it. Just barely not enough. I need one more city. I'll just keep on my path of destruction for one more city. I find another city that is about the size of Brooklyn, probably the capital of this country. I land in it and get to work, scorching the city and eating any mages I can find. I grab a mage and realize she is like a twin of the other one. She squirms and screams in my hand as I toss her in my mouth and swallow her. Just like a tic tac. I swear if I ever see rule 34 of me eating humans I'm gonna destroy whatever earth made it. I do the whole trick of turning the city into a vacuum and let all the humans choke and die. Now, all that's left is the magicules. Souls gained. 58,253, 136,268. Human Mage DNA, 69%. Magic Yules gained, 12,756, 246,504. Abilities gained. Abyssal Fireball, shoot a ball of fire that burns the soul. Abyssal Water Ball, shoot a ball of acidic water. Abyssal Lightning, shoot black lightning from your hands. Abyssal Heal heal something or slowly decay it. Abyssal magic missile, shoot a weak magic missile that rarely misses its target. Abyssal earth magic, you can control all dirt, stone, and metal. Abyssal water magic, you can control all water. Abyssal fire magic, you can control all fire. Note, each of these skills has been infected by your abyssal nature turning each of them into abyssal versions and powering them up significantly. Noise. I just need like three more big hunts and I'll get a big upgrade courtesy of the voice of the world. Now that I have all the souls I need and more, I fly off towards something strong to kill. Dash. In the meantime, in a frozen castle sits a red-haired young man wearing the bare minimum of clothing. A few women in maid outfits wait on him. Each of them are nearly twice as strong as Sarah is currently. Misery, it seems there's a little bird who hasn't learned her lesson. Tell me, what should I do? Misery bows slightly and says. I do not believe she is slighting you. Instead, she seems to have created a situation where the humans around her had no choice but to either kill or chase her off. After getting what she believed to be justification, 
She then proceeded to destroy two cities and then fly off. I believe she has a rather violent personality and a hatred for humans, but she didn't want to incur your wrath. Guy looks off in the direction of the bird who was currently attempting to hide her presence. Maybe. As long as she doesn't keep doing this, I don't care. Guy closes his eyes and sips on a drink on the table next to him. Dash. I fly above the forest of Jura and towards a creature that's slightly stronger than me. It seems to be some sort of giant monk. It has brown fur and rocky hands with two giant tusks coming from its lower jaw. I shrink myself before getting closer and do my usual of turning into a missile and becking its head. It seems to sense me halfway through and pulls its long arm up to block its head. My beak pierces the fur and skin rather easily, leaving a giant gaping wound. The monk flings me away with a slap that rocks my entire body. Ah, 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 ah. The monk starts yelling at me in anger as I charge up an atomic breath. The breath slams into its chest and singes the hair on it, but doesn't kill it. It charges at me and tries to punch me. I dodge out of the way and use one of my arms to punch it straight in the gut. I then use another to grab its arm and yank it to knock it off balance. It falls over onto its back and hurriedly rolls to try getting back on its feet. However, I kick it in the face as it pushes itself up. The punch rocks its brain as I blast it in the face with a beam of plasma. The plasma liquefies its head in seconds. Man, that's got to give you a headache, huh? I turn big and munch. Monka rock DNA, 100%. No abilities or mutations have been gained as you already have better versions of them. Magic yours gained, 23,846, 270,350. Monk gives strength. I decide that after how easily I killed the monk that was stronger than me, that I'm gonna hunt something majorly stronger than me. I can sense something strong in the ocean, but I'm not able to see what exactly it is. Something is blocking it. It's not as strong as say a true dragon or a true demon lord, but it's relatively strong. Stronger than me at least. I fly out to meet it and... It's big. It's blue. It's got quite the ugly mug. It's a sea serpent. Chapter 27, Mouse Ozo. The sea serpent seems to be basking itself, as it's at the surface of the water. Now, this may be a tough fight so I won't pull any punches. I'm gonna start off with a giant wave of abyssal lightning. I start gathering energy into my four hidden arms and start letting myself fall down to where the attack can actually hit. I get about 200 meters above the water when the sea serpent finally opens its eyes and spots me. But, it's too late. Lightning rushes from my arms and slams into the water around the serpent, with one slamming into its back. It lets out a loud hiss and starts diving underwater. I keep firing lightning into the water and charge up a gravity beam, since that's also electricity. The yellow lightning shoots out of my mouth and slams into the water, evaporating most of it on contact and hitting the sea. Wait, the serpent isn't there? I can no longer sense the serpent's magicules. Suddenly, a giant splash happens below me as the serpent comes barreling forth out of the water and attempts to bite me. There's no way for me to dodge so I just decide to coat my feathers in venom and let it bite down. I forgot about the lightning shield though, as the serpent slams headfirst into it. The shield shocks the serpent, which then escapes underwater again to hide from my attacks. I use water magic and fire magic to start heating up the water underneath me, trying to boil the creature alive. It pops up out of the water again but this time, it's behind me. It manages to bite onto my back and gets a mouthful of venom. However, that bite manages to break my skin and rips out the feathers in that area. It takes a chunk of my flesh with it. Fuck that hurts. I expect the serpent to start trying to wash out its mouth, but instead it eats the flesh like the venom isn't even there. Notice, sea serpent venom is some of the strongest venom to ever exist. The venom of a warbit cannot be compared to a sea serpent. All right then. Time to get serious. I stop my attacks and instead watch the water all around me, waiting for any movement at all. I see a splash of water coming from behind me and shoot out a gravity beam towards it, but hit nothing. Then I feel a burst of pain as the serpent bites into my leg. As it falls back into the water, I just barely manage to clip it with a gravity beam. This attack rips some of the flesh off the creature's back. Holy shit this guy is giving me a fight. However, both of my injuries have already regenerated, while his seems to be regenerating at a slower pace. I start boiling the ocean underneath me to hopefully make it uncomfortable. The serpent tries to trick me again by messing with the water and then hopping out another spot, but this time I catch it doing it. The second it hops out, I hit it with a gravity beam right in the head. 
This knocks it out of the way and allows me to grab its head. As I grab its jaws, it shoots out a beam of water that cuts into my stomach. It cuts into me and manages to do a lot of damage to me. I point its face away from me and bite into its head. The canines I have, as well as Razor Beak manage to cut straight into its head. This manages to paralyze it while I pull it onto the land. As we get on land, it just barely manages to regenerate enough to start moving again, but I bite its head straight off. I quickly say its head to keep it from regenerating. I eat the rest of the corpse as well. Magic yours gained, 57,241, 327,591. Demon Lord Seed acquired. Hatching Demon Lord Seed. Suddenly, a voice is heard round the world. Individual Seraph has met the conditions for evolution into a Demon Lord. The Harvest Festival shall commence. Warning, forced evolution imminent. Warning, you are being forced unconscious. Whoop, I'm unconscious. Jeopardy theme intensifies Guy sits in his frozen castle with Rain sitting beside him. He sips on a red wine as he hears the voice of the world. Individual Seraph has met the conditions for evolution into a demon lord. The harvest festival shall commence. Guy smiles and chuckles lightly. Ha, huh, so that's what the little bird was doing. I see why she went on those rampages. She knew about needing to collect souls for the festival. Rain gets a shocked look on her face. Guy had been keeping an eye on that bird for a while now, so she had also. She had seen this bird as a weakling who was caught up in unfortunate situations. First, she gets caught up in Milim's berserk attacks, then she is messed with by humanity, and then she gets into a fight with Rabadon the Sea Serpent. You are telling me that was all on purpose? Guy stops laughing and smiles while talking to himself. Looks like the next Warper Geese is going to be fun. Dash. A N short chapter to take use in writing a book that could actually make me a little money for once. Give me power stones and write reviews so more people will click on my book. Comment. 14 comment. Vote. Chapter 28 Harvest Festival. Gaia stands, watching her world slowly recover from the thousands of years these aliens had ruined it. Just recently, she started to finally feel the planet coming back to life. She sits on her nest, as she prefers her bird form. She had started creating offspring herself after her mother left her. However, they're nothing but mindless clones she refers to as oracles. She really wishes to become the god of the people that evolve here. A few times, she has had to kill a Jaeger that comes through the breach, but it's been a while since one has come in. She was in the middle of pumping some titan energy into her planet when suddenly, Seraph is going through an evolution into a demon lord. All beings related to her shall receive the rewards of the harvest festival. Gaia jumps as the voice pierces her skull out of nowhere. E -e -e. Before she could get angry about the jump scare, she passes out in her nest. Dash. Ares and Rumi are playing with each other on a green and blue Mars. Rumi has been very committed to creating a paradise on it. Several sentient creatures have appeared on it since Sarah left. A few had to be wiped out by Rumi, due to their inherently destructive nature. The Titans of Mars have fully recognized Rumi and Ares as the Alphas, and the Hollow Mars has as well. The Titans of Mars are far calmer than the ones on Earth, with most being gentle herbivorous giants. There's a flying whale who seems to have quite good control over gravity, a Titan similar to the Brachiosaur of Earth, and a giant creature made of stone and earth. Ares calls it a Gollum, while Rumi calls it Rookman. Rumi and Ares are playing around, throwing Earth's latest probe back and forth, when suddenly they hear a voice. Seraph is going through an evolution into a demon lord. All beings related to her shall receive the rewards of the Harvest Festival. These two don't jump however, as they're used to talking to one another. Rumi's eyes sparkle as the seemingly older girl talks like a child. Ha! Huh. Mama got demon lorded. Ares nods her head. It seems she's in Tenshira right now and just completed a big milestone. Rumi nods her head and speaks again. Mama is also. Suddenly, both of the girls fall unconscious with a thud. The titans of Earth are freaking out suddenly. The Earth suddenly stopped its usual aura that seeps out to let titans know it's okay. Godzilla is having to run around and knock several titans back to sleep and tell them that everything is fine. Honestly, he now wishes Seraph was back to deal with these things. She got them done in hours while it took him two whole days. He is concerned however. Earth has never gone silent before. Chapter 29, Second Welper Geese I find myself waking up with my entire body sore. This is definitely a first. I can feel. So much strength. I feel like I could punch earth to pieces easily. My arms hidden under my feathers feel like they could rip the earth in half. 
I feel my longing for space grow even further. Harvest festival completed. All known related entities have finished their evolution. Magicules gained, 487,265, 757,615. Cell or DNA, 100%. Abilities gained. Water spout, you can shoot a spout of water from your mouth. Water portation, the unique skill of the cell lord. While underwater, you are able to teleport to any other location in the same body of water in an instant. Mutations gained. Water sac, you have a sac in your body that stores water. Neurotoxin sac, functions the same as the other toxin in your body, but is much stronger. Dash. Status. Name, Seraph, Mama, Mommy, plus six. Sex, Femoid. Race, Abyssal Demon Dranix. Class, Titan Emperor, True Dragon, Demon Lord. Titles, Titanic Emperor of the Abyss, Demon Lord of the Abyssal Plane. Wingspan, 1,002 meters to 2,476 meters. Height, 275 meters to 582 meters. Magicules, 169,676 to 757,615. Assimilated DNA, 17. Titan Emperor, your strength has grown you to a point where you can be considered near godlike by other titans. This is the final step before becoming a demigod. Your authority over the Abyss has grown stronger. Titanic Emperor of the Abyss, attacks from creatures below 400k magicules will no longer deal any damage to you at all. Note, this does not apply to machines. Dash. Abilities gained. Abyssal Mini Dimension, as your authority over the Abyssal Plane has grown, your control has as well. You are able to create and control your own miniature dimension. In this dimension you are immune to attacks from any being below the level of Demigod. Abyssal Aura, your aura now unleashes the terrifying qualities of the Abyss. Any weak being under the influence of your aura will not be able to stand. Abyssal Kin, any being related to you will receive a bonus to their strength while in the same dimension. This also makes them feel much happier in your presence. Abyssal Life Creation, you are able to create life related to the Abyss. Note, Titanic creatures cannot be created for now. Abyssal True Dragon Haki, an aura-based attack that shreds weaker life forms and does heavy damage to beings of your level. Universal Sense, allows you to detect almost all sensations including sound, light, smell, and temperature in a wide area. In space this size is around double the influence of the sun's gravity. Mimicry, universal shape shift, you are able to change every property of your body. Your minimum size is now. 5 meters and your maximum is double your true size. Mutations gained. Abyssal being, your skin, feathers, and fur have all been infused with the abyss. Any creature below 100k magicules that touches you will die immediately. Note, does not apply to machines or your kin. Abyssal breathing, being in the abyss of space shall now give you energy in small amounts. Ah that explains my longing for space. I suppose I'm still weaker than Guy and Milim. I stand up now that my muscles are no longer sore and I'm just about to start flying when suddenly, a portal opens up in front of me. I shrink down to two meters but stay burb as a blue-haired maid walks out, rain. Lady Seraph, Demon Lord Guy Crimson has called for a wall geese, if you would follow me. I nod my head and walk in behind her. I see quite a different place than the one from the anime and manga. I guess it makes sense, this may very well be the first or second wall geese ever. I can see that there are only four seats currently. After our evolution into demon lords, a lot of pipsqueaks are gonna declare themselves demon lords. The hall I'm in is large and grand, with a single table at the center. I walk over to the table and sit on my chair in my bird form. It seems I'm the first one here. May as well catch some shut eye. I only nap for a few minutes before I feel a massive amount of magicules appear in the room. Guy walks in and takes his seat in one of the chairs. I ignore him as if he wanted to talk without Milim and Raymarice, he would have. Eventually another mass of magicules starts flying towards the area of Walpagis. Milim, obviously. She crashes in through the front door and runs over to her chair while yelling. Hey Gu Ayeli. Guy smiles at her and waves. Raymarice isn't here. I guess she's going through rebirth now, because the her from before would probably be here before me. Guy emotions to Rain to introduce everyone. Lord of Darkness, Demon Race, Guy Crimson. She turns towards Milim. Destroyer, Dragonoid Race, Milim Nava. She then turns to me and motions for me to introduce myself. Abyssal Phoenix, Seraph. Guy looks at me with a smile and is about to talk before Milim interrupts him. 
Wow. You're a talking bird? I chuckle at her childlike innocence even though she's destroyed multiple cities. I turn into my humanoid form with a toga on me. Is this easier to talk to? Milam looks at me and gets stars in her eyes. Wow. But, why are you so weak? I smile at her and stop hiding my aura. It envelopes the entire room and causes misery and rain to fall to their knees. I then quickly retract it as I don't want to get them sick. Wow, that's like, almost as strong as me before turning into a demon lord. She's not wrong. Her transformation happened rather late. Same with Guy. Guy then speaks up. Well then. We have to give you a title. We chose ours at the first Warpagis. You can choose whatever you want so long as it's not insulting to the rest of us. Milim chimes in. Oh, oh, Big Crow. I ignore her and pretend to think for a while. Titan of the Abyss. Milim looks at me and gets a confused look on her. It's cool, but why Titan? You're pretty tiny compared to the giants. I smile at her warmly and continue. I'm shrinking myself right now for convenience. My real size is too big for this room. Milim looks at the ceiling and back at me and says. That's pretty big, so you're as big as a true dragon? I can understand why she thinks that, this room only has a height of about 20 meters, and true dragons are pretty much the only creatures bigger than the room. No, dear. I'm much much bigger than a true dragon. I can show you later if you want. Milam nods her head and is about to speak before Guy interrupts her. All right. Titan of the Abyss it is. Quite fitting honestly. I can tell you this Milim, she is definitely bigger than a true dragon. Guy smiles and checks out my humanoid body. I knew he was a sex fiend but damn dude. I look at Milim and see her doing calculations in her head of how big I could possibly be. Well, this Walpagis has been rather enlightening. Milim does indeed act like a kid and Guy is indeed a sex maniac. We spend the rest of the time eating and talking to each other before we finally decide to end it. Chapter 30, Becoming a God after the Warpagis ended, I was sent a ring that could be used to communicate with the other demon lords. Apparently there's already been someone who claims to be a demon lord, but was never announced by the voice of the world. So here comes the age of weak cast demon lords. During the Tenma War, I'll be sure to eat their corpses. They can at least act like supplements. I fly off towards the west to set up my own kingdom. Due to Milam destroying most of it, there's just land ripe for the taking. Maybe I'll be the god they worship and not the queen. Ooh maybe I can finally do something interesting. I turn into an almost completely human form, but still make myself 500 meters tall. The only monstrous things about me are my wings, arms, and feathery hair. I fly over multiple cities on my way to the west, using healing magic as I pass to cure everyone inside of it. I come across a completely empty field with a wide river running through it. I land and start using earth magic. I create a giant 50 meters tall wall in a dozen kilometer area. This will be my house, temple. Only my kin will be allowed in this wall. Then, outside of that I build a less tall 15 meters tall wall. This wall shall encompass around 100 kilometers. I build several buildings close to the 50 meters wall, which will be the noble area or priest area. I build a small wall encompassing this small area. Nothing too big, as it's just to keep any possible homeless out of the noble area. I build several boarding houses throughout the city that will act as free homes for the homeless. Of course, if you're in a boarding house here you have to find a job within a month. These will be run by Can I Create. Then, I get to work building a few giant shopping areas. Several stalls, stores, and even malls are built in this area. I dot a few orphanages around the city as well. These will also be run by my kin as humans can't be trusted with children. Especially when those children may not be human. I make a key around the river to allow some riverfront property. I build a couple real estate offices around the city that will deal in various prices of housing. Once again, it'll be run by my kin. I fly out to the outer wall of the city and use life creation on the ground. Large fields start to paint the landscape outside of the city with farmhouses dotted throughout in small clusters with a guard facility placed in each cluster. I don't want my farmers to be killed by some bandits or something. I build up a roadway system throughout the city, all paved, and start building the bones of houses along it. The houses get bigger the further in you go. There we go. Eyes Kyring City. I build myself a gigantic temple with a huge 50 meters tall throne at the center for me to sit in when I'm bored. Now, it's time to design my kin. I'm thinking they'll be 2 meters tall humanoids with black wings with each pair of wings representing their rank. I make 2 androgynous people with 6 wings. 
These two will be like the Pope from Earth, just with actual power. They'll have about 400k magicules. Their goals will be to talk to me and bring me strong monsters to eat. I instinctively know what skills they have since I created them. They have control over the same magics from this world I have and that's about it. I decide to give them a little more power and give them the death breath. Not my abyssal breath attack, but its devolved form. They each get a toga crafted from my silk. I then create 54 winged people with all of them being androgynous. These ones have about 200k magicules each. These will be the priests, nobles, real estate agents, and any other job I only want my kin to control. These ones only have the magic. Then, I create 502 winged people. These will be the guards starting out. Each of them has 100k magicules. They have individual spells they can utilize, with none of them having control of more than two types of magic. Then, I create 2,000 no-winged people. These will be laborers and regular citizens. Each of them has about 20k magicules, still relatively strong, but not by much. I walk over to the two six-winged I created and talk to them. From now on, you two shall be Raphael and Rogel. I see them look at me with worship in their eyes as they feel themselves having a connection with me. Raphael has more feminine features, with beautiful black eyes and hair. She has absolutely perfect skin, and looks a little similar to me, just with pale white skin. Regal on the other hand has completely black skin and a more masculine feel to him. He's the taller of the two, standing at nearly 2.5 meters tall. He also has black hair and eyes and perfect skin. They both fall to their knees and speak. We shall serve you with all of our being. I nod and get them to head to the temple and wait for me. I then address the 54 wingers. You all shall be allowed to think of your own names. Ten of you shall be priests with the rest of you deciding on your own jobs. They bow and say the same as the other two. I then head to the two wingers. You all shall protect this land for the time being. Once we have a good enough population to fill your roles, you can start looking for other jobs. They do the same as the others. Then it's the no wingers. You all shall be citizens of my kingdom. You shall own stores, work fields, and do any other jobs that are created. Live your lives in whatever job you desire. Become artists, musicians, or even janitors if you so desire. You may be the weakest of my kin, but you shall have the greatest degree of freedom. You shall be the backbone of this kingdom. However, some of you will be needed to run the orphanages and boarding houses. Keep that in mind. With that, I leave the bowing group of people to themselves and fly towards my temple. I shrink myself down and walk through the front doors. The doors are made of gold-plated aluminum with the temple itself being reminiscent of a Greek temple. The entire city is rather beautiful in my opinion. Most of the houses are incomplete as you can't build a house entirely out of stone. The first job the laborers will have is finishing the houses. I see the six wingers standing in front of my throne, waiting for me. I grow to about 70 meters tall and sit on the throne. All right. You two shall rule this kingdom, with me making suggestions from time to time. Anything you two don't agree on shall be brought before me. You are in charge of every person in this city. Do not let this power go to your head though, as both of you are easily replaceable. They bow their heads as Raphael asks. Venerable one, what shall we refer to you as? I think for a second and say. I am Seraph. Goddess of the Abyss, Fertility, and Magic. I give them some bullshit to spew to the priests to preach. My religion shall have five core tenets. I create a giant monolith in front of the temple. I inscribe on it. Thou shall not kill the innocent. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not discriminate. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Thou shall not abuse. These five will be the start of the religion. You too shall create other minor tenets for the religion to follow, based on these core five. They nod their heads as Rigel asks. What shall we refer to your kingdom as? I think for a second. This is a hard one to think of. But, eventually I settle on one I'm quite happy with. Abyssia. This is the kingdom of Abyssia. Now, on to your duties. I wait for them to leave the room and start creating another life form with seven wings. This person is female. They have about 500k magicules. Their job is to find and kill creatures for me to eat, as well as act as my attendant for future warper geese. She falls to her knees and looks at me with worshipping eyes. I can feel it instantly, she's attracted to me. Well, they all were to an extent, but it's like she's Albedo and I'm Momunga. Oh venerable one, will you give this lowly being a name? I nod my head as I look at her. She's got most of the features I have. She has wolf ears, feathers on her hips, but normal human legs. 
Her face is absolutely gorgeous, and her skin is white as snow. She has a slim figure with C-cup breasts. She has slight hips on her stomach with wide hips. I create a toga for her and think of a name for her. You shall be known as Lucifer. You are to be my attendant for wall piggies. You shall also hunt and bring me the corpses of strong creatures so I can further grow my strength. Of course, I'll reward you for this. I look at the woman who hurriedly nods her head. Yes, venerable one. I shall bring you the corpses of the strongest beings in this world whenever they shall appear. I nod my head and give her a smile. Good, Lucy. You and only you shall refer to me as Sarah. However, in front of others you should call me Lady Seraph, just to keep up appearances. I hope to be good friends with you. She seems to melt as I call her Lucy and tell her to call me Sarah. She nods her head once more and looks up at me with hearts in her eyes. I shall dedicate my all to you Lady Sarah. I nod my head and the girl enthusiastically flies out of the room to find some creature for me to eat. Well, now I guess I can just sit until the tenor war kicks off or another warpagis is call oh, never mind. I feel a mass of magic eels flying towards me and instantly know it's Milim. I guess the girl wants to see how big I can get already. Chapter 31, The Abyssal Dimension I shrink down and head outside of the walls to meet Milim as I don't want her tearing down a building. She lands in front of me with a thud that leaves a crater around her. I create a gust of wind and clear away the dust around her. Hi Milim. She looks at me with a smile and says. Seraph, I've come to bargain. Well, that quote feels familiar. All right. What's your bargain? She walks up to me and continues on. You show me your bigness and I'll show you mine. All right that sounded wrong. I think she means her battle mode. I mean, it's better than the clothing, or lack of, that she has on now. I sigh and change into my bird form. All right, I'll have to fly a little further away from you all right? Milam nods her head with an amu sound and I fly away about a kilometer away. I start to grow up to my max height. 582 meters. I could see Milam's face from all the way up here thanks to eagle eyes and could see her just staring up at me in shock and awe. I'm probably the biggest creature to ever exist in this world. I shrink myself back down and fly back to Milam. Bigger than you thought, huh? Milam just kind of stares for a second with her mouth wide open before saying. How can something get that big? I chuckle a little at her reaction and change back to my human form. I pat her on the head with one of my hands and motion towards her. Well? Let's see your big form. She nods her head excitedly. She walks back a little bit as her form starts to shift. Her features turn a bit more rigid, and armor slowly starts to cover her body. A giant red horn pushes out of her forehead and stops at just about another head above her. Now she looked like a dragonoid instead of a stripper. Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. so cool. I say with faux surprise. She nods her head and lets out a few amus before turning back to her regular form. She looks at the wall behind me and asks. What's this place for? I smile at her and say. I was bored and decided I wanted to act like the god of some people. I thought it might be a nice change of pace instead of running around the world and hunting stuff. Milam nods her head and says. I understand. I have some people that decided they wanted to worship me when I saved them. They call themselves Dragon Bread Bowl or something. I pat her head a little and then tell her. You're welcome here anytime Milim, just be a bit more quiet with your arrivals, okay? She nods her head and smiles at me. Thank you Sarah, I'll be super quiet next time, I'm the best at being sneaky. As she finishes saying that, she takes off in a blinding mashup of light. Raphael and Riggle appear beside me and speak in worried tones. Venerable one, are you okay? I nod my head to them and say. That was Demon Lord Milim Nava. She is to be welcomed into my temple at any time. Treat her kindly. They nod their heads as I move back towards my temple. As I get inside, I decide I want to see something. I open a portal to another dimension. My dimension. I walk through the black inky portal and come out the other side to be greeted by an inky black dimension with black clouds forming the sky. I can feel a connection with this place formed the second I walk in. I know I can control it. I use this power to create a house in the center and transform the ink into grass on the ground around it. The house is a log cabin with a TV, bath, tub, shower, kitchen, and library in it. The library is stocked up with some of my favorite manga I've read. I pick up one called Archmage Villainous and start reading it. The story is pretty interesting to be honest. It's very much a pawn though. I put the book down and draw myself a bath. The hot water that comes out of the faucet sends steam into the air. I strip off my toga and lay down in the bath. 
I may never have to clean myself, but that doesn't mean it doesn't feel good to soak yourself every now and then. I sit in the tub for what feels like hours, but the water never gets cold. This is like a dream come true for me. Growing up American, there isn't really a bath culture. The tubs always suck and are tiny as fuck. Even my slim figure from before could barely fit under the water without some random part of my body poking out. This tub feels like alien technology to me at this point. I feel my worries start to melt away. I change some of the abyss into a wine glass and make some wine appear in it. I do feel like a god in this dimension. I eventually get out of the tub and make the water turn back into abyss. I put my toga back on and leave the dimension. Eventually, I'll make it to where my kids can come and go in there as they please. I'll make a gigantic castle with workers and everything. You know, I never thought about this but that abyssal life creation skill is amazing. I no longer have to give birth to the mindless clones I made on earth. Speaking of, I wonder how G-Man is doing? Before I died, Godzilla vs Kong was the last Monsterverse movie so I have no idea what happened after that. Some say Destroyer may appear, which if he does he'll get slapped around by my clones. Well, I guess it's an unfounded worry. Earth had indeed been attacked by Destroyer. Godzilla sensed him coming, and also sensed that he was far weaker than Destroyer. He could only hope some miracle would help during his fight. As Destroyer dropped down and touched a city in Mexico, he let out a loud screech that caused all the clones to go berserk. Within seconds, one had appeared and started to rip him apart. I was able to put up a good fight against it, but once the second appeared it turned into a pecking fest. Destroyer was very quickly turned into a mass of pecked apart flesh and bone. It was this that made Godzilla think. Damn, I'm glad she's on my side. Ray Maryse walks up to the unconscious Sarah and puts her hand on her head. All dark red magicules that entered her body are being absorbed into Ray Maryse as Guy fights Milim. Ray Maryse picks up the unconscious two meters body of Sarah and carries her off into a little cave nearby where she seals the entrance to keep her safe. Ray Maryse clutches her chest as a red energy starts appearing on her body like a parasite. Damn, if that little bit of energy caused me to already feel different, I can only imagine what Milim's will do. She flies off to bring Milim back and leaves Sarah in the cave alone. Chapter 32 Effects of the Harvest Festival Earth had changed quite a bit since Seraph's evolution into a demon lord. First off, its size had increased quite a bit, growing to be about a quarter bigger. Another separate continent has formed that is shrouded by a black fog. Any creature going near it has died. No titan even attempts to approach the island, feeling that they will certainly die should they approach. This island was created by Earth for Seraph and her kin. The island itself is gorgeous, shaped like a raven. It's about the size of Australia but is instead a temperate evergreen forest waiting to be carved out by any inhabitants. The creatures of the island seem to live in harmony, with every one of them being an herbivore. They help each other survive, with the taller goat-like creatures knocking leaves out of the trees they eat fruits from, and the mouse-like creatures eating the leaves dropped by them. There is however one thing that sets these creatures different from the rest of the earth. Each and every one of them has black fur, skin, feathers, or scales. The scariest part about them is the fact that each one of them starts off with about 50k titan energy. Dash. Ares and Remy just woke up from the harvest festival. They look at each other and notice something. Their hair has black strands through it now and they feel some connection to another dimension. Ares decides to see the new dimension she feels attached to. She creates a portal to the dimension and walks through. She is greeted by an all black cube with a mound of grass as the ground. A large log cabin sits in the center with a welcome mat at the front. Ares walks inside as Remy finally builds up enough courage to walk into the portal. Whoa, it is so pretty. Remy starts running around the grass, feeling it rubbing against her feet. It feels just like the grass on Mars, except even softer. Ares walks into the cabin and immediately feels warm. She smells her mom's scent in the cabin. Tears start flowing from her eyes as she takes in the scent. I guess I missed you more than I thought. Dash. Gaia wakes up on her throne and finds black grass growing underneath her feet. She also has black streaks in her hair. She stands up and feels the world around her asking her if she's alright. She kneels down and pets the grass underneath her. I'm okay, Atlas. My mum did something that made us all stronger. I suppose it's about time I fix you fully huh? Titan energy shoots from Gaia's arm, coating the entire planet. Life starts to pop up all across the planet, starting with a black grass. Trees with black leaves start to form. Water becomes a clear blue all across the planet. Gaia feels Atlas happiness wash through her like a whiskey. 
she smiles warmly at her planet and runs her finger through the glass. I love you too, girl. Her planet basically functions like a child for her. You know, at first I hated mom for leaving me here by myself. But Atlas has made this so much better. I wanted to be a god, which I still do, but now I feel like I've calmed down. I just want to live a happy life with Atlas now. She feels the same connection with the dimension that Ares and Rami are currently in. She opens a portal and lets Atlas know she'll be gone for a little while before walking in. The second she walks in, she sees Rumi playing around in a field around a log cabin. Rumi senses her entry, and feels a connection form between the two. A smile grows on Rumi's face as she sees her and she yells out while running to her. Sister. She jumps up into the air for a hug, but Gaia sidesteps her and the makes her face plant on the soft grass. Gaia yells out in confusion. Mom had more? Rumi pulls her face up with grass sticking to her face. The grass falls off and turns into a black misty ink. Her smile still plasters her face as she speaks up in her usual cheery voice. Yup. Mama had me, Ares, and you. Gaia nods her head and speaks again. And what's your name? Rumi. I'm Gaia. I guess you're my older sister or something? Well. It's nice to meet you. Rumi nods her head and smiles before asking. Do you wanna play with me? Gaia shakes her head and says. No thanks. I'm more of a sit still and relax type. Rumi frowns as she starts complaining to herself aloud. Ugh, why can't Mama have a kid that likes playing like me? Ares plays with me but she also wants to be alone sometimes. Nobody likes playing with me. Rumi runs away crying as Gaia starts to feel guilty. She has no idea how to deal with people, thanks to her not having another person to talk to. Her eyes waver as she sees Rumi run around the cabin, but she decides against chasing her. She walks into the cabin and finds Ares on the couch reading a book. Ares speaks up as she enters. I thought mommy would have more kids soon. I'm Ares, who are you? Ares looks up at her and smiles. Gaia is a little off put by Ares' aloof nature. She speaks up. Ah, I'm Gaia. Ares nods her head and speaks while reading. What planet did she have you take care of? Gaia sits down on another chair in the living room. It's called Atlas. It was completely dead before I got there. Ares nods her head and continues. She put Rumi and I on Mars. We just recently started to get more titans appearing on it. Before you ask, no I'm pretty sure we aren't from the same Mars as your dimension. Ours is completely green and blue now. Gaia nods her head. That's weird. My planet's grass is black. Ares nods her head and chimes in with some information that might help. It's probably due to our mother's evolution she just went through. It probably awoke your abyssal attributes more and affected your planet as well. We terraformed ours before she ever left the dimension. Gaia nods her head and decides to leave, having introduced herself to the two. I'll be going now. Atlas is a bit of a clingy type. Ares nods her head and goes back to reading her book. Gaia leaves the dimension and immediately is asked a bunch of questions by Atlas. Don't worry girl I'll tell you. She went about the rest of the day talking to Atlas about the dimension she just went to and talking about her sisters. Chapter 33, The Divine Mist Since Milim left, a few years have passed by. Humans and the monsters alike have been pouring into my city after hearing about it. At first, humans were attacking the monsters, but a quick round of executions were enough to quell their hatred, or at least make them live with it for now. Any attempted murder is an immediate execution, as the judges are able to see through any lies thanks to the truth seer ability they got. I don't know how they got them, but I'm not gonna question it. I've started being worshipped as a god now. Churches have been built all over the city to give people a place to learn my teachings. Every now and then, I'll heal someone who prays for healing. It's a little boring just sitting still, but due to my nature, I don't mind it. It's rather peaceful in my city due to the near demon lord levels of my creations. Lucy has been bringing me the corpses of several slightly strong monsters, leading me to have gained about 100k magicules. Magicules gained, 112,759, 870,374. I've noticed that after becoming a demon lord, I've stopped incorporating other creatures' DNA into my own. I can feel why. My body may have gained a temporary boost from the other DNA, but now it's trying to purify itself. My body yearns to be free of its draconic side, to be a true phoenix, a being unobstructed by death, forged by abyssal flames. The creature even immortals fear. An abyssal phoenix, this blood is keeping me from my true strength. The filthy lizard blood. 
I think for a few hours on what I can do to become a pure phoenix. For now, I have no known methods, and I'm not some medieval doctor who believes you can bleed someone's heritage from them. I realize that I may get an answer as I grow, because I've still got a long way to go before demon lords reach their peak strength. I can feel another group of people coming to my city, in a caravan of sorts. As they are welcomed into the city, I feel something change within me. I feel warmth wash over my body. I feel a connection spread from me to every individual under my influence. As this connection forms, I feel every individual in the city look towards the temple and bow to pray. A golden light erupts from my body, as I feel a halo start forming above my head and my skin starts to turn brighter. This warmth feels, wrong. Suddenly, the golden glow from before is infected by a dark inky black. It makes my skin go back to its usual black color, and even turns it a smidge darker. My wings erupt into black flames as a dark mist forms around my body. The halo from before becomes dark like a black hole, but still gives off a warm glow. This mist continues on. It expands from my body to the corners of the temple, then escapes from the openings and quickly consumes the entire temple district. It passes through the gates into the noble district and covers everything in black. It covers the common district and even begins going beyond the walls. At first, everyone felt fear well up in their hearts. But this fear is gone as the mist nears them. It fills them with a calm and warm feeling. Crying children fall silent, screaming men and women instead freeze in place. The priests all around the capital begin their prayers. O Abyssal One, bathe us in your presence. Let us be free of illness, and unfearful of death. Protect us, for we are thy kin. Though our presence is meager, our belief in you shall shake the world. O Abyssal One. The mist grows to cover all territory controlled by the city-state of Abyssia. Every individual touched by this mist feels themselves calm to the point of true and utter peace. Their injuries are healed. Sickness is banished. They feel themselves grow more lively. The elderly feel several years younger. Any criminal feels themselves grow remorseful for their actions, no matter how petty. People feel all hatred, anger, sadness, or envy fade from their bodies. Everyone looks towards the temple, just in time to see her. Sarah flies above her temple, in a billow of smoke. Her wings bathed in a black flame that seems to swallow any light that comes near. She looks out over her city and lets out a cry. Scree ee 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 papa pushing. Her black halo burns brightly as she calls out, bathing the entire country in a dark glow. The clouds that were covering the sky that day seem to have vanished, leaving a bright blue sky. I go back to my throne and sit. Immediately, I'm greeted by a screen. You have successfully evolved into a divine titan. Status. Name, Seraph, Mama, Mommy, plus six. Sex, Void. Race, Divine Abyssal Drenix. Class, Divine Titan, True Dragon, Demon Lord. Titles, Divine Titan of the Abyss, Demon Lord of the Abyssal Plane. Wingspan, 2476 meters to 2746 meters. Height, 582 meters to 684 meters. Magicules, 757,615 to 984,632. Assimilated DNA, 9. New abilities. Divine Realm, your abyssal dimension has been upgraded into a divine realm. Your divine realm can be whatever you imagine it to be, and the souls of your believers shall be there for eternity after passing away. Divine Presence, individuals much weaker than you cannot stand in your presence while this is active, and shall fall to their knees. New Mutations. Divine Aura, your aura fills people with warmth and has a calming effect. Divine Titan, due to you gaining a significant amount of worshippers, you have taken your first steps towards becoming a god. Agent disease shall never affect you. Divine Titan of the Abyss, attacks from enemies under 700k magicules shall no longer affect you. Congratulations. Balloons. You have taken your first step into godhood. Chapter 34, Divine Realm. So, I'm officially divine huh? I can feel each and every one of my believers praying to me right now. It feels warm. I suppose I should spruce up my realm huh? Make it a big ass city of paradise. Yeah. I'll do that. I create a portal and walk into my realm. Ah. I can sense it. Rami, Ares, and Gaia have all been in here. I miss them so much. Anyways, I turn the cabin and the grass into ink and spread my senses all around. The entire area of my realm in kilometers is around 100 million. Quite big. I'm gonna turn this entire realm into a utopian paradise. I'll use Earth in Star Trek as reference. And every store will be run by a mindless android. 
Nothing will cost anything because everything is infinite in this world. As I grow, so will the city. I'll also create a hidden area just for use by me and my family. It'll be a gigantic palace in the middle of a forest. Yeah. The city instantly gets built before my eyes. The skyscrapers shoot up into the air for kilometers and kilometers. Drones patrol the streets, picking up trash and cleaning any dust. Androids stock shelves with items that come in. They're completely human, orc, and hobgoblin features take them out of the uncanny valley. However, a blue light on their temples shows that they're in fact androids. The entrances to the city are in four corners. People who die will come back here however they desire to appear. They will then be picked up on a bus that will lead them to what I've affectionately called Heaven's Office. There, an android will give them papers to write their names on and will also inform them of the fact that they've been welcomed into paradise. I also have to make a hell for them to go to. Obviously, Lucy will be able to access hell. Her job is to torture their souls for however long their crimes warrant. Of course, pedos, murderers, rapists, and any other awful doing will result in eternal hell. I create a couple million demon androids who will be the administrators of some sort. I make hell as awful as possible. The walls and ceiling are holes that insects constantly crawl in and out of. The ground is a red fleshy pus ridden carpet. Cells made of flesh dot the landscape. The demons feel right at home here but fuck it's gross to me. I leave. I'm not gonna make Lucy stay there. I'll just give her access and administrative powers over it. Now the utopia. I make the sky a bright blue with no sun in sight. Clouds dot the landscape and occasionally star train storms that avoid any living being and just wet the ground. The city itself seems a little bland with its futuristic nature, so I decide to make it futuristic nature. The houses are combined with natural structures, making the city feel like it's alive. Trees and grass paint the city like a beautiful orchestra of nature. Birds fly all around. Small monkeys swing from tree to tree with smiles on their faces. Dogs wander around, being fed by friendly android shopkeepers. There's a large park every block. There's pools people can just swim in that are cleaned by nanobots. Yeah. I've made paradise. Oh. First arrival. I teleport back to the entrance and see an elderly goblin woman here alone. She looks around in fear before a friendly goblin android walks up to her. Welcome mom and congratulations. You're the first to arrive in paradise. The goblin woman looks less scared now that she sees one of her own kind and asks. Young man, where exactly am I? The young android holds her hand and says. You've arrived in paradise. The realm of Lady Seraph. I am afraid that I must inform you, but you have died. Due to your good nature and adherence to the tenets, you have been allowed to reside in paradise, the world of unending happiness. The goblin woman falls to her knees and starts crying and praying to me. I feel so much warmth from her. It seems her death really worried her. I decide to show myself. I walk out from my hiding place and approach the woman. I know her name immediately as it is put into my brain. Missy. Due to the nature of naming for monsters, I decided that my guards shall name lower monsters and higher monsters shall be named by increasingly stronger ravens. This one was named by a guard. Missy, raise your head. She looks up to me in reverence, feeling our connection. I put a hand out to help her stand. The small goblin shakily reaches out and lets me take her hand. You are the first person to arrive in this world I created for you. I call it paradise because it is as close as it can get to it. You'll never have to work if you don't wish to, as everything in this world is free. You shall be able to live for eternity in peace. Your family shall one day follow you should they believe in me and worship me. Congratulations. I rub her head and imbue a small amount of magic eels into her to give her a warm feeling. Her form slowly starts changing into that of a hobgoblin woman about 30 years old. She finally decided on her form that she'll keep forever. I motion to the goblin android and he continues to take her to the bus that'll place her in the city. Two more people have arrived, but I'll not visit them. I appear back in my throne room and find my two angels in front of me. Yes, I've started calling the two six wingers the angels. They both are kneeled in front of me and speak. Lady Seraph, I sense something has changed. I nod my head. I had sensed it for a while. The Tenma War is coming soon. I look at her and nod. Then, I speak. Indeed. This world is about to be invaded. However, I have something much more important to talk about. I've finally become a lesser god. The two angels look up at me with reverence as they notice the black halo above my head. I give them a second and then continue. As such, I have authority over my believers' souls. From now on, any true believer of mine who follows the tenets shall be welcomed into paradise after their death for all eternity. 
However, any who break the tenets shall serve time in hell where they shall be tortured for a set amount of time. Incorporate this into the teachings of the church. They both nod their heads and walk off to start a meeting with all priests. I stare up into the sky as I feel the energy from the actual angels of this world. It's disgusting. It's not divine at all anymore. It feels more corrupted. Chapter 35 I am Seraphim. A.N. New Ranking System. I'll only cover the ones that actually matter for now here, the rest can be found in an auxiliary chapter. Thanks overlord underscore 1000 for the suggestion. B rank, 100k plus magicules. A rank, 500k plus magicules. S rank, 1 meter plus magicules. SS rank, 10 meters plus magicules. SSS rank, 100 meters plus magicules. X rank, 1b plus magicules. Dash. I spend the next few years increasing my power as much as possible for the Tenma War. Lucy kept hunting and hunting for me, bringing me stronger and stronger creatures as the world strengthened itself in preparation for the war. I was just a little bit off of one million magicules when Lucy brought me another creature. Magicules gained, 14,825, 1,013,071. Evolving. Oh God. Dot. Dot. Greater than dash greater than less than dash less than dash v dash v greater than dash greater than, carrot carrot. Dot. Dot. Uck my head. I feel like Kirby just danced inside my skull. Wait. Why am I stuck inside my temple? Congratulations on reaching one million magicules. Oh shit. Actual balloons. Dash. Status. Name, Seraph, Mama, Mommy, plus six. Race, Divine Abyssal Phoenix. Class, Divine Titan, True Dragon, True Demon Lord. Rank, S. Titles. Divine Titan of the Abyss, Demon Lord of the Abyssal Plane. Wingspan, 2,746 meters to 4,264 meters. Height, 684 meters to 1,032 meters. Magicules, 984,632 to 1,483,010. Abilities gained. Abyssal Phoenix Fire, a flame that burns only the soul, leaving the physical body untouched. Can spread and cannot be put out without your consent or a stronger being. Abyssal teleportation, you are able to teleport to any shadowed area or anywhere in the void of space. Mutations gained. Immortality, should your body die, you will be reborn in a pile of ashes somewhere in the world you currently inhabit. Spiritual body, attacks with no magical attribute attached to them will phase through you. Unique existence, you are a unique existence across the multi-dimension. No other abyssal phoenix shall exist while you do. Holy shit I feel strong. I shrink myself down and leave the temple. I fly off towards the middle of nowhere over the ocean. I grow to my full size. My eight wings unfurl themselves and flap, causing immense waves to form under me. I make gravity beams come from my feathers like Ghidorah did with his wings, and send a beam of electricity from my mouth along with a sonic screech that circles around the entire planet four times. Why do all this? Simple. You 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 are unlimited power. Because I wanted to. Man. If Guy wasn't protecting them, I'd go destroy a city or two. Well. Now that I got that extra energy out, I'll go wait for the Tenma War. It's only a few days away. Well. I'm not too worried. The only thing that could pose a threat to me are the Seraphim. But. How could something that's a mere copy be stronger than the original? They are a Seraphim, while I am the Seraphim. They're creatures created using my name. I am the god of the abyss. They are mere imitations. As I get angrier and angrier at the creatures using my name, I feel it. The crack between dimensions opens and two seraphs fly towards my position with a legion of angels. Very well then. You won't reincarnate after facing me bitches. Your souls will be in the abyss. I grow to the biggest I can get using my universal transformation, which is double my true size. I tower over my city, visible for hundreds of kilometers out. My wings spread, encompassing almost half of the city. My anger continues to rise as I spot the two seraphs looking at me with smug looks on their faces. I teleport in front of them, leaving a shield over the entire city. I charge up a proton scream, and cut through the week's B rank angels. The S rank seraphs tank the hit but are surprised by how much it hurts them. It manages to singe their feathers slightly. They fly at me and start releasing their own attacks. One stabs me with a sword made of holy power, but what can holy power do to a holy being? 
The sword pierces me like a regular sword, and the seraph wielding it gets burned by my acidic venom that coats my body. I cover my entire body in abyssal mist. The seraphs seem to understand its danger, as they immediately fly away, leaving their sword inside me. I laugh at them and talk. My my, I suppose even mere imitations can be slightly strong. Allow me to introduce myself. I spread my wings out completely, nearly reaching the height of Mount Everest. I am Seraph, the being you are named after. I am not a mere angel. I am a fucking god. Something about these creatures pierces me off beyond belief. I want to show off. I want them to see how worthless they are before me. I want them to grovel in pain. That is my name. A blast of abyssal mist spreads from my body, catching one of the seraphs off guard. The body starts convulsing as its soul is ripped from its body and thrust into the abyss for all eternity. The body itself ages. Which shocks the other seraph, as they are supposed to be unaffected by age. In its panic, it shoots me with a beam of holy magic. I absorb the magic like it's nothing. It turns to run away, but I teleport into its shadow and appear in front of it. It falters backwards for a second as it sees my eyes staring at it in anger. It turns again to run, but I appear there too. Do you understand now, little angel? I am sovereign. I am a god. I, A, M, Seraph. I blast its body with a combination of abyssal mist and phoenix fire. It screams in pain as its soul is ripped from its body and tortured with phoenix flames, until it finally disappears. Everyone else managed to kill the angels without issue, except humans of course. Guy and Millen probably dealt with the angels with even more ease than I did. I lift the bodies of the two seraphs to my face and eat them whole. I feel an overwhelming amount of holy magic invade my body. Magicules gained, 264,829, 1,747,839. Abilities gained. Abyssal holy magic, you have control over the holy element. Abyssal Holy Spear, you have a Holy Spear attached to your soul. This spear is able to sense the souls of whoever it pierces. I then eat the rest of the angels' corpses. Magicules gained, 121,059, 1,868,898. I look to where the fleeing seraphs are and know I won't have enough time to kill more. This is quite sad. I let a few fakes get away. They better avoid me during the next wars. I've already got a taste for angel blood. Chapter 36, Walpagis. Guy calls for a Walpagis immediately after the angels had left. I call Lucy back to accompany me to the meeting and rename her to make her stronger. I just name her Lucy, which causes a spike in her power. She grows to be just barely S rank. I wait for either Misery or Ain to show up and take me there. Eventually, a green-haired maid shows up before Lucy and I. Lady Seraph, if you don't mind. She bows slightly and motions towards the portal. I shrink down to my smallest form and hide my magicules. I land on Lucy's shoulder and tell her to walk through. We're greeted by the same empty hall with a table set up in the center. I mentally command Lucy to sit at the table and I look at the new arrivals. A vampire girl, Luminous. An angel of all things, Dino. And a giant, Digruel. As usual, I arrive before the other three and relax on my subordinate's shoulder. The other three seem to be around middle A class with only Dino being low us. Since my aura is retracted, they seem to think that Lucy is the demon lord. Hey, cute. Eventually, Luminous speaks up. So, anybody know why a maid suddenly appeared to bring us here? I see, she doesn't have a haughty attitude just yet. Dino, who was half asleep, says. I dunno, maybe something about demon lords. Dagruel just sits in his large chair silently, nervous about who exactly could be late to this party. Ray Maurice is the first to show up with her little fairy form flying in from the top. She sits on the table instead of her chair and introduces herself. Hi. I'm Ray Maurice. The strongest demon lord of all time. Well, I'm her prime yes. In that form, she's just barely be rank. But she has nothing to worry about because me, Guy, and Milam would all three destroy anyone who would attempt to harm her. She looks over to me and says. Oh my gosh, Seraph, you look so different. I get Lucy to answer for me. Yeah, I went through an evolution after killing those filthy bugs from earlier. She takes the hint and nods her head. Yeah. Those guys were so weak. I could have killed them all in a second, but I wanted the rest of you to have them as training. The little pixie nods her head triumphantly while I chuckle to myself. Suddenly, a pink blur grabs me off of Lucy's shoulder. Sarah. Millen picks me up and goes around in circles for a while before calming down. 
she holds me in front of her and continues. I missed you. Also this tiny form is really cute. I sigh at her and speak. I was trying to hide myself from the newbies for fun but, ha, hi Milan. I reach out a hand and pat her head. Luminous, Dino, and Dagriel all look at me confused as they hear my voice. Then they look back at Lucy, who plays the part of the servant perfectly. She stands back up and pulls the seat out for me to sit on. I teleport over into a shadowed part of the chair and sit. Milan comes over to the table and sits to my left, closer to Guy. She then continues on. I had a lot of fun after seeing how big you are. I saw Valdora destroy some city and got so excited I went and fought something. But that thing was too weak so it exploded with a punch. I wanna come play with you soon. I nod my head and say. That does sound like fun, Milan. Maybe I could get you a house near my temple. She nods her head and says. That sounds good. Some people who call themselves Dragon Faithful have started to worship me or something. I nod my head. My city does the same to me. I look at Dino and see him mutter something under his breath about Seraph. Hey, he should know since he was a Seraph too. Strangely, I feel no hatred for him. Maybe it's because of his fallen status. Eventually, Guy shows up. Well, everyone, I think you all have a good idea why you're here, correct? I nod my head while everyone else doesn't. Oh yeah. Ramiro's and Milim are a little special. Well at least you do Sarah. We're here to discuss what happened a few days ago. Misery, if you wouldn't mind. He motions for Misery to start the introductions. Lord of Darkness, Demon Race, Guy Crimson. Labyrinth Master, Pixie Race, Ramiris. Destroyer, Dragonoid Race, Milim Nava. Titan of the Abyss, Abyssal Phoenix, Seraphim. Giant Race, Dagruel. Vampire, Luminous Valentine. Fallen Angel, Dino. After the introductions are done, we start the discussion about what happened. Guy starts off. So, we were attacked without warning by angels. The beings designed by Veldenova to protect our world. Quite a crazy twist, eh? Milam speaks up next. Yeah, but they were pretty weak weren't they? I chime in. Yes, but their numbers is the problem. I was attacked by a little over a hundred. However, one of my attacks easily got rid of the fodder and left two others who I killed right after. I don't wanna reveal my ability to kill souls to Dino who I know will betray us in the future. De Gruel speaks up for the first time. Those creatures killed my people and ganged up on me like bugs. Luminous speaks up. Luckily I was able to get a barrier around my city so I didn't suffer any damage. Dino keeps his mouth shut while Raymarice starts talking. Yeah, I got attacked by hundreds upon millions of them and I took them all out with these hands. She holds up her fists and makes punching motions with them. The banquet continues on for a while longer as the names of the demon lords becomes widespread, no doubt due to Luminous and her racist ass church. I can already sense my church and hers going head to head someday. We have completely opposite teachings. After the banquet is over, I head over to Luminous to speak with her. So you're the girl who started another religion huh? I hope our religions never butt heads. I hold my hand out in a friendly manner. She nods her head and shakes my hand gently. Indeed. It would be quite unfortunate. And then I continue on. Well, with how different our religions are it's only a matter of time. Especially because my entire kingdom is built upon the backs of humans and the monsters alike. That and we don't allow the preachings of other deities within my kingdom. Luminous nods her head and walks away, not knowing how to answer me. She's quite cute honestly. Too bad her believers are such bad apples. The banquet ends, I say my goodbyes to Raymarice, Guy, and Milim. Then, I head home with Lucy, teleporting out with her. Chapter 37, Time Skip and Reunion. 700 years later. The past few hundred years have been relatively lax. Lucy will bring me increasingly stronger creatures to eat while I waste my time away in paradise watching TV and playing video games. Paradise almost has a population of 2 billion now, as my religion has spread beyond the borders of my kingdom. Speaking of my kingdom, the capital has grown to be larger than Tokyo with a population of about 36 million. I've had to introduce skyscrapers and the methods to make them to keep up with the population. The people have become much more modern compared to the rest of the world. Due to my magicules soaking into the ground, deposits of magisteel and crystals have been dug up and hippocute herbs are being cultivated. The magisteel has led to a booming industrial sector creating massive clean running factories. Self-propelled carriages have been made, and I introduced the term car to the people. Air conditioning is simple as well with a stone enchanted with ice magic or fire magic. 
several demir human species have popped up due to the intermingling of humans and monsters. The most common of which being the half hobgoblins. They look similar to humans, but with slightly pointed ears and grey skin. My kingdom's architecture style is like a modernized medieval. There's really no other way to say it. The noble district has nearly completely disappeared as the nobles started to live among the commoners. The nobles officially dissolved about a hundred years ago after another ten the war. They instead became wealthy commoners with high positions. Two other major cities have popped up recently, one being named Seraphia and the other being named Ramia. They are still relatively new so they only have about one million population each. Milam comes over every now and then to enjoy the absolutely unhealthy American food we have. I had a craving for Cajun food one day and started to introduce different recipes. Now it led to fast food being popular, but luckily the people in Tentura are much more hardy than Earth so obesity isn't really an issue. Lucky them. Several hundred self-proclaimed demon lords have appeared recently though, they'll probably be wiped out the next ten the war. If not, next Walpagis I am gonna push for us to only accept real demon lords. It's annoying hearing a voice come from the ring every few hours. Speaking of Walpagis, I told Milam about how I'm gonna hide myself as Lucy's pet from the other weak demon lords before doing a big show. She immediately agreed due to the unspoken rule of not getting in each other's way. Honestly, the only reason I hide myself is because of how annoying these wimps are. There's one who proclaimed themselves a demon lord and he was only D rank. Of course, Guy killed that one because he was just too damn annoying. I've reached 3 million magicules during this time, I haven't went through any evolutions though. And my system keeps telling me that the abilities of the creatures Lucy catches are just too weak to even bother assimilating them. I've noticed recently that about 100 years here is only one on Godzilla Earth. I have no clue why, but I'm guessing it's something my bird brain is too stupid to understand. Milim has reached about 17 meters magicules in this time while Guy is at 23 meters. I've noticed that the average power level has just been going up recently. Before, the average power of the world was low air rank and it is now increased to high rank. That may not sound like much, but this is a significant increase in power, like a 10x increase. Karib disappeared a few decades ago and was sealed by the good Olay hero. Lucy wanted to hunt Charybdis for me, but I decided I wanted to show off a little when it's inevitably unsealed. My church and Lumis did indeed bump heads a few times. Hers called for a crusade against mine and lost badly due to the natural strength of my people because of my residual magicules. Of course, I would have intervened but my angels wished to prove themselves. I took their souls to use to awaken my children eventually. Every ten years I use healing magic across the entire kingdom, healing every illness and injury incurred during that time. My citizens have come to call it the Festival of Dark Mist due to the mist that forms for the time I heal them. They throw a festival in the shopping areas and sell black feathers that fall from the angels as they go on their business. These feathers are used to make wishes when they're burned at an altar. Every now and then I grant a few wishes when they pray. I can sense when a worshipper is truly troubled as well so I can target them for a blessing. The past few hundred years have been calming. Though, I haven't seen Rami, Ares, or Gaia in that time so it's felt a little lonely. Lucy has been keeping me company though, she's a sweetheart. I decided to visit paradise today and I sense Remy and Ares presence near the manor in the forest. I instantly teleport there and wrap the two of them in a big warm hug. Oh I've missed you two so much. Remy's eyes widen as she yells out. Mama. Ares just hugs me silently and cries quietly. I hold the two for a few minutes before we break off the hug. Remy and Ares haven't changed a bit. Rami is still just as silly as always and Ares is still a little smarty. Let's go in. I have so much to tell you about the world I'm in. Rami excitedly follows me and Ares holds my hand as I lead the two girls into the manor. The manor is made to hold us at their height, so I have to shrink myself quite a bit. The manor is still massive though. I lead them to a sitting area with a giant projector and create an android to make us drinks. Ares asks for a green tea, I ask for a black tea, and Rami asks for a cup of root beer. We spend a few hours just chatting and catching up. I think Rami may have a little crush on Mars, who I found out actually has a female soul, so Rami is Yuri confirmed. Ares on the other hand just wants to document the changes that Mars goes through and eventually go back to Earth's moon and terraform it. Now, it's time for me to do something that'll change them forever. I plan on making them both into demon lords. Chapter 38 Evolutions Rami and Ares sit on the couch with me, drinking their drinks. Rami swallows big gulps while Ares sips gently. 
Remy cuddles me tightly while Aries has her arm wrapped around mine. I wait for the two to finish drinking, just basking in their presence. Remy finishes her root beer in about a minute while Aries takes a while to finish her tea. All right girls, I've got something that can make you both a lot stronger and will help you terraform faster. Which one wants to go first? Remy's arm immediately shoots up as Aries just lets her go first. All right Remy, you'll be first. Give me your hand. I take her hand and gently lead her to the center of the room. I push 110k human souls into her body, as well as all of the skills I've gained since leaving her except the true dragon, demon lord, and divine skills as she can't use them. And she'll be getting the demon lord skills anyways. Right now, Remy is around high A rank. After becoming a demon lord she should grow to be low S rank. As the souls enter her body, their ghastly forms and screams are a bit unsettling, but thanks to our titan mentalities this stuff doesn't really bug us. The souls pass into Remy's arm and travel towards her own soul. They melt into it, causing its light blue hue to grow stronger and darker. The skills implant into her soul as well, strengthening it even further until it glows brighter than the sun. At that point, Remy falls asleep. I motion for Ares to come over and give her the same treatment. I carry the two girls to their bed and sit beside them to watch over them for any issues. Because of my boredom, I start creating different forms of life. I create a 50 meters long whale and have the little guy fly around the sky eating magicules. It flies around me and rubs its head up against me like a cat. I then create a creature similar to a fennec fox, just much quieter and bigger. It's probably about 20 meters tall. I reach down and scratch its stomach, which elicits a chirping noise as it plays with my hand. Soon, Rumi wakes up. Her form has grown a little bit taller, and she has a more mature look to her. However, that's ruined when she opens her mouth. Nama, I got stronger. She sits up and flops over to me and hugs my waist. She did indeed reach S rank. Her hair has even more strands of black in it. She looks at the floating whale and fennec fox and starts playing with them. Before she's able to completely forget about her new strength, I tell her something. You know, Mars should have grown as well thanks to your evolution. She's probably waiting for you to go play with her. Remy blushes at the mention of Mars. Honestly, I hope Mars grows a spirit form or something similar. Remy could use some connection to someone other than Ares so she won't be lonely when Ares leaves. Remy nods her head and opens a portal to Mars. She's about to walk through when she realizes she forgot something. She runs over to me and kisses me on the cheek. I love you mama. I pat her on the head and say, I love you too sweetie. I'll send Ares when she wakes up. Rumi nods her head and runs off through her portal. Ares wakes up right after and has an older looking form. Instead of looking like a 12 year old, she looks more like 15 or 16. Her aloof nature is still showing as her face looks slightly bored. She slowly gets up and walks over to me before giving me a hug. I pick her up and set her on my lap while patting her head. Ares grew a lot more than Rumi did. If Remy was at around 1 million energy, Ares is around 2 million. You feel stronger? She nods her head and speaks up. I'd like to terraform the moon. It feels like it's calling me. I think the moon may be begging me to help it. I think I got a few skills relating to terraforming as well. I got one that lets me convert my energy into atmosphere and release it from my body. I can also create water now. I think I wanna do this. But I don't know how to break the news to Remy. I nod my head and listen to her. I think you should talk about this with her. Besides, the distance between the moon and the Mars is nothing for us. You could always visit her at any point in time using the shadows. I know she'll understand. Besides, it seems that she'll have Mars to play with soon. Ares nods her head and speaks. Yes. It seems like Mars has been becoming more and more sentient lately. Before it would talk to her with just signals, but recently it's been using some type of voice as well. It seems that Mars is becoming similar to Tenshira's world. I wonder if they have different voices. Ares decides that she should talk it out with Rumi and hope she understands. I have a feeling she will, because Rumi has experienced the same thing as her. Ares leaves through a portal as silence takes over the manor. I decide to name the whale Kale because why not, and I name the fennec fox Jeff. His name is Jeff. Chapter 39, Copycat I leave the manor and pop back into my throne room. There hasn't been a war piece in a while. The last one was ended rather abruptly by another ten the war. The angels slaughtered the weak demon lords leaving just me, Guy, Milim, Raymarice, Dino, Dagrul, Luminous, and someone called Kaslim. 
I've become rather estranged from the group as I tend to keep to myself and use Lucy as my proxy. The humans of this world refer to me as the Titan of Abyssia, due to the tales from the Tenma Wars. Fear of the Demon Lords has been spreading recently, mainly due to Luminous Little Religion. By now, my own religion has grown to encompass the entire continent aside from the Holy Kingdom Luminous Runs. Their priests refer to my believers as heretics, while mine just try to preach my words because of the teachings. This has grown the number of souls entering my realm by thousands. Holy wars are honestly a good thing because every believer that enters my realm adds a little to my magicules. Magicules gained, 426,821, 4,173,442. I'm not growing fast enough. If I wanted to grow more now I would have to hunt and kill demon lords, which would piss Guy off immensely. Maybe I should start a holy war against luminous religion. Surely the casualties from it would grant me more strength. I wish I had a way to get Milim's magicules breeder. That girl has just been getting stronger and stronger. Guy is a different beast altogether. I have no clue how he gets so strong. Wait, didn't he copy Milim's skill? Lucky bastard. Notice, you could sacrifice a certain amount of skills to use to either create a titan energy reactor or a skill copier. How much would I have to do for each? To create an energy reactor, you would need to sacrifice 10 abilities and mutations. For the copier, you would need to sacrifice 14. Get the copier. Sacrifice these, slash, aqua jet, ink spray, turn humanoid, impregnate, alpha cool, sacrifice, pounce, water spout, bullet time, ink sack, bioluminescence, size control, water sack. Notice, 14 abilities and mutations have been sacrificed. In their place, abyssal copiancel has been obtained. Abyssal copiancel, you are able to copy a skill. After each copy. The ability will be on cooldown as it forces an ability to merge itself into your brain. Depending on the skill, it can be as little as an hour or as much as one meter years. Oh damn. This ability seems pretty fucking good. I'll have to copy the magic kill breed during the next warper piece. I could call one and just say it's to chat. Not like demon lords have anything better to do. I bring the ring up to my face and say. I'd like to call a warper piece. After a second, Milam chimes in. I'll react. Guy's voice then comes from it. Sure. Then Luminous. I was wondering when the next one would be. Everyone else either ignores our voices or just doesn't respond. Warpagis is on. Dash. Misery eventually shows up and brings us to the usual banquet location. I didn't bother bringing Lucy this time and instead changed my body to look like her. I take a seat and just sit silently. Luminous arrives first and looks at me confused. Ah, Lucifer? Where is Seraph? I wink at her and say. I am Seraph, Lucy is back at my temple. I just didn't want to bring her today. She nods her head and takes her seat, no longer talking to me. I don't mind that honestly, I'm a bit of an introvert myself. Dino and Dagrul arrive next. Dino has had a spike in power. I suppose he just got Lord of Sloth Belfiga. He's at about 3 meters magicules now. Once I get Milim's reactor, I'll be swimming in energy. Kazarom shows up with a mask on. I wonder if they're actually ugly under there or just wearing the mask for fun. Then, the star of the show arrives. Sarah Awa. Milam runs up to me and hugs me. I wonder why this girl is so obsessed with me. Hi Milam. I pat her on the head as she runs her face into my stomach. I suddenly feel time stop as a selection screen shows up in front of me. Wow. Even beings like Milam are stopped by this. I guess the system really is a higher creation. The screen lists off all of Milim's abilities and skills from weakest to strongest. Things like fire magic show that it would only take about two hours for the skill to cool down, whereas something like the Wrathful King would take three years to cool down. Magic Kill Breeder Reactor however shows that it will take me about half a year to recover the ability. I tap on the reactor and a screen shows up. Are you sure? Why, N? I tap yes and I feel a burning sensation in the side as my full body brain is manipulated to hold this skill. It's not unbelievably painful, but man is it annoying. Time restarts as the ability goes on cooldown. Magicules gained, 1, 4,173,443. Magicules gained, 1, 4,173,444. Only tell me after I wake up from a long nap. Noted. Milim continues rubbing her face on my until Guy shows up. She then gets up and walks to the side before sitting down. Raymarice shows up with Guy and looks at me a little confused, but then realizes why I look like Lucy. 
Guy then speaks. So, why did you call us today? I nod my head and speak up. I wanted to say hi since it's been a while. That's it really. That and I'm sure humanity is shitting themselves right now because of this meeting. Dino, Dagru, Luminous, and Kazaram all get a look of really bitch. On their faces, I look at them and say. If you don't wanna catch up you can always leave. At that, Dino, Luminous, and Kazaram all leave. Dagrul stays however. I look at Guy and say. I may not be able to attend the next few Walpagis. I'll be sleeping for a while after this. Maybe over 1000 years. I'll wake up every 10 the war though. If it's something urgent, inform Lucy as she could wake me up. Guy nods his head. I'm a bit annoyed that you won't be attending, but I understand. It's your nature right? I nod my head and say. It's not easy keeping such a big body energized. Dagrul seems a little confused as he's never actually seen my titan form. Guy, Milan, and Raymaris on the other hand all seem rather understanding. Of course, I'm bullshitting but they don't need to know that. Well. It seems like my time here in Tenchura is gonna be peaceful after all. Chapter 40, Testing Out New Strength. 300 years later. Well, I'm officially the strongest demon lord. Turns out, the magic ill breeder is slower than I thought. The more magic eels my body becomes saturated with, the less magic eels it creates. However, if I actually used my body's magic eels during my attacks, it would never let me run out. Apparently, Kazaram named Claim and his replacement if he ever dies. We're not really supposed to do that but wait. Milim has visited multiple times over the past few hundred years, and each visit she makes, I copy another skill of hers. Several of them were ignored due to their uselessness, but I took a couple from her. First, Milim Eye which was copied and renamed, Abyssal Eye. I can detect lies, see through walls, and even see the exact level of someone's strength instead of just a general feeling. Next, Milamir was renamed to, Abyssal Ear, which makes me able to hear something on the other side of the planet if I so desire. Abyssal Eye, and, Abyssal Ear, combined together to create, Abyssal Sense, which basically does everything those two do and also gives me the ability to feel things through shadows. Next, I gained her, Space Magic, ability that allows free teleportation, and a dimensional storage. Then, her, Drago Nova, and, Drago Buster, abilities. And finally, the big boy. Lord of Wrath, Satan Ale, which actually wasn't an ability or mutation. Instead, it was a title. The effects of the title state the following. Lord of Wrath Satan Ale, the more your anger grows, the stronger you become. Eventually, you enter a berserk-like state where only the destruction of whatever causes you anger will end this rage. I've managed to stave off Milim's wish to fight me by using an excuse about me being weakened. Even her, Milimai, skill can't see through me erasing my signature. I'll fight her eventually, just not now. Not that I'll lose, I just don't feel like it. There's still about a thousand years till cannon starts. I'm looking forward to seeing Tempest. I'll probably head there with Milim. I don't really care for Amoyu and his people though. I'm not gonna simp for some blue blob who takes the form of an underage girl. Mainly, I just wanna sit in the hot springs with Milim, Shin, and Shuna. Of course. I'm kicking the perv out. And the food. My country has a more western style of cooking. Pastas, fried foods, pizza, the whole shebang. Of course, no British food because we like flavor on our food. Sadly, Chinese food is more my thing. Teriyaki beef jiao mine. Ha. Huh. I guess some Tenchura style Japanese food would do. Damn it, I've still got about a thousand years before Tempest exists, so. Gotta get the food out of my head. I'll get some lasagna. So, I head into my town and get some lasagna. It was pretty good, but they used a little too much meat. I wanna test my power out now so I head out into space, heading to another planet in the solar system. I wanna try bringing life to another planet now, and to destroy another. I wanna see how fast I can do either. With the amount of magic eels I have, I should bring life fairly quickly. I should also be able to punch a weaker solar system out of existence since I'm about as strong as Milam in canon. I'm not gonna punch the solar system, but I am gonna punch one of the planets in this system. I land on a planet further away from the Tenshira world. It's more of a dwarf planet like Pluto, so life is relatively unlikely no matter what. Sorry little guy. I reel my arm back and... Boom. My fist emits a shockwave through the planet, immediately causing a gigantic crater to form across half the planet as the shockwave travels across the planet, it comes back around and pushes the crater back out like a splash of water. 
chunks of the planet start flying out into space, leaving trails of rapidly cooling lava behind them. Half of the planet slowly flies away, leaving a hot iron core rapidly cooling in the vacuum of space. Well, I can certainly say I killed this planet. Next up, bringing life to one. I fly to a planet closer to the sun. The Tentura solar system has three planets in the Goldilocks zone, giving me two candidates for terraforming. One of them has quite a lot of ice on the caps while another has very little, so I'm gonna choose the one with more ice. Mars has very little water, so a more water-centric planet may be interesting. I'll have a blue kid on that planet. I won't name her Aqua because I guarantee that would make her useless. I'll name her Undyne. I land on the icy planet and start the terraforming process. I start letting the magicules come from my body and inject itself into the core. Immediately, grass starts growing from the injection site and spreads rapidly. The temperature starts to increase rapidly as the planet starts to form an atmosphere ripe with greenhouse gases. The ice at the caps starts rapidly vaporizing and liquidizing due to the increase in temperature. Water starts flooding the surface of the planet and clouds start raining. Volcanoes erupt across the surface, creating new land masses. Green foliage starts to cover the surface rapidly. Trees shoot up from the ground, soaring high into the sky. Eggs start to be created in the ocean as creatures rapidly evolve to become multicellular. Within a month, life has started to take over the land as well as the ocean. So, there's my timer. One month. That's all it takes for me to create terrestrial life on a planet. Insert dream speedrunning music. I decide now is a good a time as any. I use my offspring production skill and start creating a baby. I make sure I'm in the water for the process because I'm doing something special for this baby. First things first, I give her a single set of wings covered in blue feathers. I give her a human body with arms as well. Her hair is long, blue, and feathery. And the most glaring difference between her and my other kids, I give her the bottom half of that one sea serpent I killed on Tentura. Her more fishy features shine through, with her bird features taking a bit of a backlog. Then, I finally start making her. The whole birthing process seems to have gotten easier. It takes only a week for me to create and lay the egg, and about a month for the egg to reach its full size of about 200 meters. Unlike my other children, she will be born a demon lord due to her nature as a clone of mine. I could have made her not a demon lord, but I would rather my kids be strong. Her egg starts to crack as one hefty blow rips through the shell. She swims out in the blink of an eye and crashes into my chest. Mother. I'm greeted by a typical Anisan type girl with rather big breasts, blue hair, blue eyes, and a beautiful voice to top it all off. I rub her head and let her swim around with me in her arms. Hello there Undyne. It's nice to finally meet you sweetie. Chapter 41, I'm back baby. Undyne and I spend a few years together getting to know each other. She's very sweet, and loves to baby people. I'll have to give her an I'm to type little sister eventually. She seems to be rather peaceful and loving too. Undyne named the planet Lapis on account of its blue color. Something happened a few years after her birth. Lapis eventually was overtaken from me by her on accident. I honestly didn't care, but Undyne came up to me crying and asking me to forgive her. Mother please forgive me. Undyne swims over to me with waterfalls coming from her eyes. She wraps her arms around my waist as her tears soak my side. I grab her face and wipe away her tears before saying. It's okay dear. I was wanting to give you this planet anyways. Lapis is your baby to take care of. She looks up at me with teary eyes and says. Really? I chuckle a little to myself and rub her head. Yes, really. She smiles at me and straightens herself up. She then hugs me and is about to say something as the entire planet starts shaking. I sense that the temperature of the planet has started rising incredibly quickly and the ice caps on the north and south poles have started rapidly melting. Slowly, the sea levels start rising faster and faster. Entire continents get covered by water, mountains start drawing, canyons start becoming trenches. Eventually, the entirety of the land disappears under the waves, except for one point. A single mountain top remains above sea level. I teleport over to it using water portation. I get out of the water and stand on the mountain top. Undyne follows right behind. I speak to her as I feel her connection with Lapis grow. I suppose little Lapis wanted to make it more comfortable for you. Undyne smiles and looks down at the ground. I look at her and ask her a big question. Would you like me to make you a sister? Undyne looks at me and shakes her head no. No. Thankfully you gave me the same ability you used to make me. I think I'll have my own children one day. I understand that you have to leave me here, but I can always come and see you. After all, 
I also have the Voidborn skill. I nod my head and smile at her. True. I'll make sure my people know about you. Visit any time you want. I'm looking forward to seeing what this planet turns into in a few hundred years. She smiles at me and gives me a hug before I leave. I've been feeling a need to get back to Tentura for a while now. I jump up into the air and take off. I've been staying in my humanoid form for a while now, so I change into Burb as I'm in the air. I blast past the atmosphere and end up in the void of space. Beautiful colors as always. Purple, blue, red, green. All kinds of colors created by distant supernovas and galaxies fill my eyes. Bright stars dot the landscape around me. Space isn't as empty as people think. I quickly fly back over to Tentura and enter the atmosphere before shrinking myself down to around normal raven size. I fly over to my kingdom and notice something. Over 90k soldiers from Luminous Kingdom marching towards my citizens. My own soldiers are marching out to meet them, but a prayer cuts into my mind. The voice of a little goblin girl. Please venerable Seraph, don't let my daddy get hurt. Mommy can't sleep because of her worries. Brother has chased after him as well. Please. Please keep them safe. Well. Can't let a little girl down can I? I speak in the little girl's mind. Worry not, little one. This battle was over before it started. I fly to the battlefield between the two armies and decide to make a flashy comeback. I instantly grow to around 100 meters tall and let my aura crash down on the enemy army. Every soldier in their army falls to their knees and groans as I let out a sonic screech. Scree papa pushing. My body flares up as I activate the biovolcanic ability. Using the ring, I contact Luminous. Luminous, an army of your kingdom is outside my capital. Do you mind if I just kill them all? After about three seconds I get a reply. Just don't kill all of them. Leave a few of the stronger ones please. Anyone else is fine. All right, thanks. I hear Guy come over the ring as well. So now these rings are just used for communication? I reply back. Shouldn't have made them so convenient. And then I ignore anything else coming through. I face the army of my people and speak. People of Abyssia, hear me. For centuries, we have been a land of freedom and love, spreading acceptance and warmth throughout the world. The people before you stand for the opposite of my ideals. They are the very definition of the word bigot. They stand to take away the acceptance we have spread over the centuries, and commit genocide on the majority of our people. Your friends, neighbors, and family. Thus, I condemn these sinners to death. After saying that, I turn around and release a cloud of death mist over the army, only sparing the lives of the strongest ten among them. The ten survivors watch as their friends begin to die around them before quickly decaying, and turning to dust. Even the equipment on their bodies and grass under their feet turns to dust, leaving no evidence of them ever having existed. The ten soldiers all look up at me with fear stricken faces. Hear me, lucky survivors. Go and spread word of what has happened. Let your leaders know of how futile their endeavors truly were. Tell them of how truly foolish they were to believe they could overcome the might of a living god. The ten soldiers quickly get up and run off towards the forest behind them, leaving behind their weapons and shields. I turn to face my army once more. You all have done well. I commend you for your bravery. A wave of abyssal healing magic spreads from my body to grow to cover my entire kingdom in seconds, healing every illness and injury that had occurred while I was gone. It also extended the lifespan of everyone affected by 40 years. I guess it's back to playing God. I'm back baby. Chapter 42, I am. An ant. After being greeted by a crying Lucy who practically cursed me for leaving from those few years, life went on rather peacefully. Luminous Little Church branded me and my followers heretics, which ended up backfiring on them. They won't have nearly as much influence as in canon, but they are still relatively popular in the smaller kingdoms, especially near the forest of Jura. 750 more years go by as we get nearer to the start of canon. Clayman becomes a demon lord after What's-His-Face dies. Carrion and Frey become demon lords, and Veldora is sealed by the hero. Said hero is now currently inside of my city as well. She's walking towards my temple in a beeline. Suppose she would know about me being a disruption in the timeline, or she just sees me as a dangerous being. I send a telepathic message to the guards to let the little hero in as I finally completely awaken from my sleep. Magicules gained, 9,852,927,334, 13,128,629,839. Congratulations on reaching 10 billion magicules. Oh, confetti now. Geez, I guess I've still got a bit of a way to go before becoming a demigod.
The hero is led up to my temple by a guard. The guard stands at the front of the temple, as only six wings or more are allowed in the actual temple. Before she walks in, I grow to the max height I can and sit down on the massive throne in the room. The hero rounds the corner and looks up at me with a small amount of fear present in her. Her black hair envelopes her mask like a frame as she walks towards me. I lounge on my throne and look her in the little slits on her mask for her eyes. Well, little hero, what business do you have with me? She looks at me and says. I'm begging you, please don't kill Rimuru. The hero prostrates herself in front of me in a dojeza. I'm shocked. I don't really have any reason to eat such a weak creature. I mean, Great Sage would be an awesome skill to have, but I already have the system. I guess Great Sage would be a good skill to have actually since I can actually ask it questions. I'll just copy it after it fully evolves. I look at the hero and sigh before speaking up. Ha. Huh. I don't know what future you lived through before this, but the me of this iteration has no need for whatever creature this Rimuru is. Who names their kid Rimuru? Anyways, you have nothing to fear this time around. As I am talking to her, I copy a certain skill of hers. Ability obtained, Yog Sototh, Lord of Space Time. Your abyssal nature has corrupted this skill. Ability evolved, Abyssal God of Space Time. Abyssal God of Space Time, space is your domain. Time is your slave. You are now immune to the pure void present between universes. You are also immune to any time based interference by beings up to 1 trillion magicules. Note. This ability is in a weakened state due to you missing prerequisite, demigod. As she looks at me, the hero feels a sudden headache come over her as her memories of me have disappeared. She knows that it's me from her memories, but any that include me are now obscured slightly. I chuckle as she holds her head. You have nothing to worry about Mazorbit. So long as the little slime doesn't cross me, I'll have no problems with it. In fact, I rather look forward to having a meal in its little town. I smile at her and shrink myself down to her size while teleporting into her shadow. Due to my temple being naturally dark, I can teleport anywhere throughout it, but her shadow feels more godlike to me. I put a hand on her shoulder and walk in front of her. While you're here, you may as well enjoy some of the things my city has to offer. I highly recommend a restaurant called the Silver Cat. They specialize in cooking monster meat and offer some pretty great wine. Unfortunately, I won't be joining you because... I stretch my arms out and yawn. Ha, you did wake me up in the middle of my nap. A blush comes over the hero's ears as she hears this. It's kind of cute actually. I smile at her and teleport back into the bed in the back of the temple and call Raphael to come show her the way out, and a guard to show her to the silver cat. The comfy feeling of arachne silk made sheets. Ha, I never want to leave this bed. It's so warm and soft, though, it is a bit lonely. Luckily I'm a titan, so loneliness doesn't really affect me hey. I may cuddle Lucy when she's back from whatever she's doing. Suddenly, I feel an immense amount of fear as I drift asleep. I try to wake myself up, but my consciousness fades away. As I fall asleep, I feel a pulling sensation. I open my eyes and find myself in a pitch black space. No stars. No air. Nothing. Just emptiness. That fear I had earlier seems to slowly fade as I feel the environment, or lack thereof. It feels like home, even more so than the void of space. It feels cold, yet comforting, like being embraced by the ghost of a loved one. As I float forward, I feel myself bump into, something. That fear wells up inside me yet again and I'm forced to my knees. My entire body shakes and sweat builds up across my body for the first time since my birth as a titan. A gigantic red eye opens up in front of me. I am an ant to whatever this being is. I hear a series of clicks and pops in my head as this being speaks to me. Note, anyone who doesn't feel like typing that into a Morse code translator, the translation is here greater than. With that, my consciousness fades yet again, and I jolt awake. Ability gifted, Abyssal Star Devourer. I am, an ant. Chapter 43, Star Eater. As I jolt awake, I find myself back in my bed, soaked in sweat. I gasp for air and feel something coming up from my chest. I start coughing and crawl over to the side of my bed. I cough up some sort of black sludge that immediately starts eating through the black carpet of my bedroom. I use some abyssal breath to destroy it, but find that it does absolutely nothing to it. Well, it's a good thing that whatever that is is out of me. I see that over time the glob of whatever starts to disappear after eating through about a foot of ground. I replace the ground underneath, but I'll need an actual worker to recarpet the bedroom. Anyways, with that out of the way, describe that new skill. 
Abyssal Star Devourer, you are able to gain energy from stars like a parasite. The amount of energy differs from star to star. Ah. It's pretty cool. I'm gonna go try it out real quick. I inform Lucy this time, and take off into the stars yet again. I teleport to a random star system with very few planets. This system only has two full planets and they're both dead. I fly over to the star, which is bright orange, and activate my skill. I feel my body start heating up and absorbing the plasma from the star. My body falls into a sort of trance and starts orbiting around the star. Several hours go by as I fully absorb the entire star. I slowly but surely wake up. Cake class star absorbed. Magic yours gained, 738,526,862, Note, size change hasn't taken effect due to the gravitational interference of a star. Due to your absorption of this star, size change can take effect. This will lead to growth without limits. You will still be able to enter star systems, however in your full size you may possibly develop your own gravity. Proceed. Oh, ah. Uh, yeah, sure. I feel myself curl into a ball and change into my bird form yet again. A sort of egg forms around me as I fall asleep. Dash. Ten years later. I wake up and see pitch blackness around me. I feel, sluggish, like I could sleep until the end of the universe and nothing would wake me, except of course a notification from the system. Magic yours gained, 108,453,952, 13,975,610,653. Showing status. Dash. Status. Name, Sarah and hash exclamation mark dollar a dollar serif, mama, mommy, plus six. Race, divine abyssal phoenix. Class, divine titan, true dragon, true demon lord. Rank, Y. Titles, Divine Titan of the Abyss, Demon Lord of the Abyssal Plain. Wingspan, 4,264 meters to 364 kilometers. Height, 1,032 meters to 59 kilometers. Magicules, 1,483,010 to 13,975,610,653. Dash. Way to God I'm Mother Father H.E. Double Hockey Sticks Fudging Second. How big am I? At my full size, I'm nearly five times the size of the Earth's atmosphere. If I stood on Earth's surface at full height, I'd be visible from space. And this is only after like a few thousand years. If I had this magicule generation during the Godzilla era, I'd be in the quadrillions of magicules, so I'd probably be bigger than the sun. Ha. Huh. Milim's ability really is unfathomable. I decide to fly over to another star and absorb it, but find a system interface blocking my vision. Note, due to the rapid gain of magicules, this ability has a cooldown for your safety. If you absorb this star, it will take a few years before you are able to absorb another. Well, that's fine with me. My full size is rather gigantic to say the least. When I orbit the star, I look similar to a planetoid. Slowly, the corona of the star I'm orbiting starts to envelope my body. This star is more yellow than orange, and feels much hotter than the last one. It takes a few days for me to absorb this one. G class star absorbed. 1,493,054,698, 15,468,665,351. Wingspan, 364 km to 392 km. Height, 59 km to 65 km. Cool down, 9 years. Bah, 9 years is nothing. I'll be absorbing stars over and over again till canon. I shrink myself back to a normal size and teleport back into the Tentura system. I stop by Lapis and say hi to Undyne, then I head back to Tentura. I fly back into my temple and get a citrep from Raphael. Apparently, the Western Holy Church has started condoning acts of violence against members of my own church. Ah, I never mentioned it. My church is called the Church of Holy Shadow. I didn't come up with the name, but whoever did probably couldn't think of anything else and wants better suggestions in the comments. I tell Raphael to let my believers know that it is right to defend oneself as well as others around them, so do not hold back against those fuckers. I'm sure she'll word it better. I wouldn't care if my religion became a warlike one, but I doubt it will with the tenants I set up at the beginning. I inform Raphael that I'll be asleep for about another hundred or so years. I get up and go back to my bedroom, finding the sheets clean, the bed made, and the flooring recarpeted. 
My room has no light whatsoever, being completely dark when the door is closed. I lay down in the comfort of my bed, letting the silk wrap around my naked body. Obviously, the only way to sleep is naked. As I drift off to sleep, I imagine myself in a nonsen, drinking a whiskey and eating some noodles. Ah! I can't wait. Time to sleep till canon. Chapter 44 Attack on Milim The past 140 or so years have been rather uneventful. Every 10 years or so, I'll go and absorb a star. So far, the strongest one I've absorbed was an A-class. It gave me about 3 billion magicules, but I had to wait for around 20 years after that one. Yet, even that A-class star is pathetic compared to what's in front of me now. A gigantic bright blue star, nearly purple. It's incredibly beautiful, yet also incredibly hot, enough that even with my biovolcanic nature activated, this is overwhelmingly hot, though, not even close to enough to harm me. I hold my hand out, feeling the warmth of the corona wrapping itself around my hand like a puppy begging for its owner's attention. I activate my ability and feel my chest immediately heat up. My cracked skin and veins filled with lava glow brightly. I become brighter than the sun of earth. The corona starts flowing into the cracks in my skin, dyeing the lava blue. I fall into a deep slumber as I absorb the star. I orbit around this blue giant and glow brighter and brighter as time goes on. I feel incredible strength welling up inside of me, greater than all other stars combined. My skin grows just as bright as the star as the star slowly gets absorbed into me. A beautiful array of colors flashes in my eyes, causing me to open them. I see a few other stars moving towards me. Weak stars, but stars nonetheless. They merge together with this giant star, trying to strengthen it. This only adds to what I can absorb though. My body grows to be brighter than this star, overtaking it, and turning into a beacon in the night sky of all nearby solar systems. I feel such incredible strength. Just before the star's death, I hear a voice speak up. Very well, ancient one. I concede. Then, the last bit of the star gets absorbed. I feel something new engraved into my brain. O class supergent star absorbed. Cool down, fifty years. Magicules have been hidden until host consents to view. I told the system a while back to hide my magicules till I say otherwise to surprise myself. But, the new feeling isn't from magicules. Ability gained. Abyssal supernova, your body expels abyssal energy with the strength of an O-class supernova. This ability can destroy entire sections of a galaxy, use with extreme caution. Don't use around anything you care about. Mutation gained. Biostellar nature, your body can become a living O-class star. These are some pretty cool abilities. This supernova ability seems pretty terrifying honestly. All right system, give me a citrep on my magicules. Magicules gained, 83,395,324,753,98,863,990,104. No wonder. I feel like something within me is trying to break through its limits. Maybe I'll evolve when I reach 100B. I can feel that something at the center of the galaxy is watching me though, this thing is beyond my comprehension even now. I don't wanna piss something off that can possibly swat me like a fly. It's nowhere near the same as that one thing that gave me the ability to eat stars, but it's strong nonetheless. I also feel that the Abyssal Star Devourer skill is about to evolve as well. I can sense that it has been about 9 years since I left Tenshira to absorb this star. System, show my status for a second. Status. Name, Sarag exclamation mark dollar a dollar serif, mama, mommy, plus six. Race, Divine Abyssal Phoenix. Class, Divine Titan, True Dragon, True Demon Lord. Rank, Y. Titles, Divine Titan of the Abyss, Demon Lord of the Abyssal Plain. Wingspan, 364 km to 573 km. Height, 59 km to 103 km. Magicules, 13,975,610,653 to 98,863,990,104. I didn't grow as much as I thought I would. Well, whatever. I don't particularly want to grow to the size of something from Gurren Ligan. Seriously, who the fuck thought making a robot that big was a good idea? I look around and see something new. My vision has increased greatly. I can see a leaf on a planet in an entirely different galaxy. This world has no intelligent life, and instead is full of non-magical animals. The only beings with magic on this planet are three dragons. 
One seems to be a western-style dragon, controlling the ground, another is an eastern-type dragon controlling the water, and the last is a mixture of western and eastern, controlling the air. The entire planet lives without war. The three dragons are brothers, born from Veldeneva. They aren't anywhere near as strong as the beings from the world of Tenshira, or even Godzilla, yet it doesn't matter, they are the sovereigns of this world. Seems rather beautiful. I won't ruin it by introducing magic. I'll name it Eden. Never mind, there is a human-like species on it. But they are primitive, using sharpened sticks to hunt and protect themselves. Interesting. I hope those dragons deal with them before they ruin the planet. I shrink myself back down and teleport directly into my temple. As I teleport in, I'm greeted by Milim who says. Seraph. You won't run from me anymore. Play with me. Now. She has a pouty face on as she grabs my arm and holds it. I chuckle and rub her head before speaking honestly. I'm afraid you're not my match Milim. Even Guy would be unable to do a thing against me. I just had a big power up. I'm almost as strong as Veldenova now. This is false. Veldenova is a being above Zed rank. Oh? And what rank is that? Inner God rank. Inner God? Is that what a demigod is? No. Inner gods are beings that rule over a single universe, or even dimension. Demigods are beings a single rank below that, ruling over worlds or galaxies. While you may have a skill that can destroy a part of a galaxy, an inner god can destroy multiple galaxies or even universes at once. That must be what the being at the center of the universe is then. I come out of my thoughts and see a teary, puppy dog eyed Milim looking up at me. I sigh and acquiesce. Ha. Huh. All right. Hold my hand. I'll take up somewhere we can fight without holding back. She jumps in the air. Yeah a exclamation mark tilde okay exclamation mark tilde. She grabs my hand and I teleport us into the void outside our galaxy. I teleport a few kilometers away from her and say. All right, let's start. She shakes her head and says. Knew you. You're not facing me at full strength. Become a bird and grow. I sigh and say. You sure you wanna face me at full size? She shakes her head yes and looks at me with stars in her eyes. I wonder if I could devour those stars, hey? So, I teleport even further away and grow to my full size. I also stop hiding my energy, allowing her to feel the weight of my strength. Milam looks up at me, her brain nearly overheating from having to comprehend my size. I chuckle as I see some steam leave her ears. Ha, huh, cute. She then gets a giant smile on her face and says, This is gonna be fun. She goes into her battle mode. This causes her magicules, that were just over 1 billion, to catapult to over 20 billion. As of right now, Milam is most definitely the strongest naturally born creature in Tenshira. If only I could copy that. Too bad it isn't a skill, but rather her just showing her actual race. I need a good power-up ability. Maybe I could go to DPZ and get Super Saiyan hee hee. I don't wanna yell for 10 chapters though. As Milam finishes powering up, she yells out. Dragonova. A blue beam of energy blasts forth from her palm. I cast a shield spell and pump 50 billion magic yules into it. I angle it to make the Drago Nova deflect instead of blocking it directly. Then, I cast a fire spell and pump 20 B magic yules into it. In the palm of my hand appears a condensed blue star. I point my hand out at Milim and a glass cone shaped around the star. Lines of energy come from the star and focus in on the point of the cone. I smile at her and say. Corona beam. The blue point turns into a laser that immediately hits Milim. She uses her arms to block the beam, causing the armor on them to start melting and her skin underneath to burn. After about three seconds, she realizes that the beam is returning to a sphere on her arm. She tries to run away but I then say. Coronal ejection. The small sphere explodes out in a wave of energy, causing Milim to yell out in pain. A-G-H, gah. She fights against the explosion for a few seconds, but then gets flung deeper into the void. Abilities created. Corona beam, you create a miniature star in your hand and focus its energy into a beam. Coronal ejection, you create a miniature star and cause it to explode. When used in conjunction with corona beam, its power is amplified. Milam looks over at me and smiles. She flies towards me at the speed of light, being unrestrained by Tenshira's voice of the world. I smile at her as I create several thousand miniature stars around me, and simultaneously activate my biosolar nature. Create star. Milim flies even faster and starts giggling madly as she wants to take my attack head on. I smile back at her. While I'm not going all out, I am indeed having fun. Coronal mass ejection. 
The stars all shrink to about the size of a penny. Then, suddenly. Bompa. The pennies explode outwards with the energy of hundreds of billions of magicules. However, due to their weak power individually, they are nowhere near the strength of an actual attack power by hundreds of billions of magicules. Milam feels her body burn, the top layer of skin turning to ash as she takes the attack. She screams out once more as her body is overtaken by the burning energy of the stars. A.C.K. Ah. The energy slowly dissipates and I see an unconscious Milan, floating in the void, with a satisfied smile on her face. I smile at her and pick her up in a princess carry. She's already recovered completely. What a little monster. I teleport the two of us back into my temple and set her down on my bed. And I lay down beside her. Honestly, that might be the most fun I've had in a while. Nothing has really made me go all out in thousands or millions of years. Title gained. Creator of magic, gained by creating your first original spell. Ability gained. Creation magic, you are able to use magicules to create something from nothing. Well, that's an interesting development. Chapter 45, Canon has been reached. After Milim woke up, she went back to her dragon faithful. I decided to take a little flight to the great forest of Jura to see the slime and where exactly its development is at now. It's probably not higher than that tribal goblin village yet, but he may have gone to that little dwarf kingdom. I don't know the exact timeline of his kingdom. As I fly over, it seems I came a little later than I thought. He's already got some developed buildings, but without the aid of the orcs it's still relatively small. You know, I could be a jerk and scare them all half to death, but nah. I don't want to change anything till after the slime becomes a demon lord. I turn into a small bird and land on a branch in the town. My presence is completely concealed, so other than seeing a cool bird, people don't really react. A few of the cute little goblin kids point up at me to their parents. I smile inwardly and stretch out, showing my deceptively massive wingspan. A cute little goblin girl spreads her arms out as well and says, Cor Cor. Once again, I chuckle to myself as I give her what she wants. Screech. I sadly don't call any long girl. My screech causes her to jump, but she gets a big smile on her face and says, Kua'o. Gosh she's too cute dude. I fly down to her and land in front of her, which causes her mother to hold her hand out in front of her. Using creation magic, I create a small version of myself as a wind-up toy and float it in front of the girl. Her mom once again moves her back as I make the toy wind up. As it finishes, the toy lets out a quieter screeching noise similar to my own. I set the toy on the ground and take off, letting out another screech. The mother lets her daughter pick up the toy and keep it. I left a little bit of Manu inside the toy that will eventually merge with the girl, granting her abyssal traits. The toy will eventually speak to her as she grows older, telling her to come to the kingdom of Abyssia. I'll make this girl one of my kin. And yes, this is only because I found her cute. Deal with it. I fly over to the house Rimoyu is in. I create a spell that'll allow me to see right through the house. I look inside and, well, it seems that Shiz was dying now. Ifrit hasn't gone berserk just yet, but he will soon. So I guess that means that the ogres aren't here yet. I'll wait another few months. Maybe I'll just hang around Tempest for a while, stealing some food from people. Also, there is no way in hell I'm ever calling this city anything but Tempest. Calling a city Rimoyu is stupid and I hate it. I fly around for a while, just stretching my wings. Every now and then, someone will look up at me. Most adults view me with a bit of fear. I suppose the bird of death is still a thing in this world, so what if blackbirds tend to be on battlefields? They just get attracted because of the smell. Though, I suppose my entire existence is built upon that bird of death thing. It takes a few days, but eventually Shizu and Go go to leave the village. I look through her skills and see nothing of note. Overall she's pretty weak. Probably low 8 tier. Rimoyu is just barely mid 8 tier. Weak compared to me, but still pretty strong nonetheless. This battle will probably solidify him at mid 8 tier. I'll put him at about S rank when he fights the piggy who got too big for his britches. Oh, looks like it's happening. Shiz stops mid walk and just stares off at her party members before grumbling into herself. She then looks up into the air as her mask cracks and then breaks, freeing Ifrit. The fire boy does his thing and destroys a lot of the village, though luckily the plot armor runs thick and no people are killed by that. The battle goes the same as in canon, so I won't describe it. Oh shit, thankfully nobody noticed the bird that was just casually sitting on a tree branch while this battle went on. Ehilda. Well, I'll come back soon. For now, 
I need to update my people's names to strengthen them. I could easily make the weakest member of my army hold an SS rank. So, I'm gonna. I inform all of my kin and they all wrap up what they were doing and come to the temple. The common rabble of all different races are locked outside of the 50 meters tall walls, but that doesn't stop some from looking through the lattice gates. I'm inside of my temple, and in a glorious display of silver light, the door to the temple expands to nearly 50 meters tall itself. Behind myself is a fake portal, to make the people watching believe I live in a different realm. All of my kin bow before me as I open the doors. My people are greeted by my 50 meters tall humanoid form, equipped with all my extra hands and wings. Over my head is a pitch black halo that seems to be forged from a black hole. I step out in front of my kin and notice that their numbers have expanded, with there even being a few children around. My religion doesn't make clergy members celibate, because that's a stupid rule anyways. I look out over the wave of black hair and wings and speak. My faithful kin, I come before you all today to impart upon you a blessing. As my strength and our enemies grow, I have noticed that my previous blessing has become more of a detriment than it has been a boon. Therefore, I shall grant all of you new names. My kin get teary-eyed as they hear this, but most of the children just look up at me in awe. They've never seen me, so I suppose it makes sense. I see one in particular who brought a small stuffed raven with him. Quite adorable indeed. I just renew the names for the ones who indeed are named, and then I get to the unnamed. Now, all of you before me hold no name granted by me, which means you possess no blessing either. Let us change this today. Form a line, but keep together with your families. I then proceed to name every family together, giving them a family name instead of a first name. I make it to where this name will apply to anyone with the blood of the main line. Immediately, the world is rocked by the birth of several hundred demon lord level beings, as well as two true-blooded demon lords. I created and planted a demon lord seed in Raphael and Dagruel. Of course, the weaklings of the world have no idea of what transpired, due to Raphael and Dagruel being granted this power inside of my own dimension. Only beings like true demon lords and true heroes will know about it. My kingdom is officially the strongest in the entire world of Tenshira. Every single member of my kin is well into SS rank or even above. Raphael and Dagruel have become X rank, making them two of the strongest demon lords to ever exist. And what am I doing after causing every true demon lord and hero to have heart attacks? I'm sitting on my throne, playing with many galaxies I made with creation magic. Well, they're not real. But they're pretty. Chapter 46, The Eyes Hours. A few weeks pass by as I play around on my throne. I keep track of that little toy I gave to the goblin girl and sense that she's already getting affected by the abyss magic placed on the toy. Her and her family are starting to have black streaks developing in their hair. She's died, but I captured her soul before the sly met her. I liked her in the show, so I'll let her be a resident of paradise. Specifically, the section made to look similar to Japan at the time of World War II just with better amenities and infrastructure. I also created a new spell I call, Soul Search. It's an ability that allows me to find souls no matter where they are. I myself may not be able to travel dimensions, but whoever decided I can't still affect them. I search for her mom's soul and find it in the possession of some earth god. Funny thing is, the dude is only B rank in power. I create a clone in the earth and make it appear before him. The old dude jumps as it appears and speaks up. Why yes great one, how may I serve you? Hey. It feels pretty good having a god grovel at your feet. I speak up. Nothing much, I just need a soul from your dimension. In return, I'll give you a blessing to strengthen you a bit. Your name is now Yala. Yes, a combo of Yaw and Ella. I'm unoriginal. Sumi. I grab Shiz's mother and put her in my realm in an exact replica of their house before the bombs were dropped. The woman looks around. H huh? She sees her house behind her. Tears start to well up in her eyes as she says. B but I. I appear behind her in my god form. Black halo, black wings, and black toga. Indeed, you did. She jumps and looks at me before bowing to me. Kami sama I look at her with a warm smile. Then, I break the bad news. Unfortunately, your daughter didn't survive the attack either. She looks up at me and gasps as she hears this. She puts her hand in front of her face while crying loudly. I speak yet again. Worry not, child. I have protected her soul as well. She may look a little different from what you remember, but she is indeed your child. I turn around and disappear from her eyes. She keeps covering her mouth and crying as she hears. Mother? She looks up and sees she's in her hero outfit. 
She looks almost exactly like her. She starts running towards her, her body slowly becoming smaller and smaller until she goes back to being a child as she jumps into her mother's arms. I smile as I see the touching scene. Mommy. Shizu and her mom collapse in each other's arms, crying. I suppose I'm not as disgusted with humans as I thought. Well, at least not these ones. I grabbed a few other souls from Japan before leaving, filling up the little town I made. Of course, I only grabbed those with pure souls. Don't want a pedo to get in my dimension. The clones will explain everything to the people here. I wait for the mother-daughter pair to stop their reunion and then appear in front of them. Your daughter has faced many hardships. Take care of her. Enjoy the rest of eternity with her. I walk over and ruffle kid Shiz's hair. Shiz, who reverted back to before her mom died, looks up at me and asks. Who are you? Are you an angel? I smile and crouch down in front of her. I then say. Not quite. My name is Seraph. I'm a goddess. I found your life to be very commendable, so I brought you and your mother here to paradise as a reward for being so pure. I scratch behind her ear, which earns a content smile. Hey. I'm such a sucker when it comes to kids. I make her the same toy I made the goblin girl, just without the abyss magic. I make the toy wind up and it starts playing some music and walking. She takes it with a wide smile and starts playing it. I then motion for the mother to come over to me. I cast a sound barrier between us and Shiz. I then speak in a serious tone. While she may have been an adult, seeing you has made her regress both physically and mentally. You should expect her to be a bit clingy. I wouldn't ask her about what happened after she died just yet. The poor girl likely has a form of PTSD from it. But, just know, she is in fact the same girl you raised. And I must say, you raised her very well. She's a sweet girl. The mother, Iakuka Aizawa, nods her head and bows. I will raise her with the utmost care. I'm very glad my daughter became someone deserving of your praise, Seraph Sama. I put a hand on her shoulder and raise her up. I think you two deserve some alone time. Look around the town, you may see some familiar faces. I smile as I say this. I wanted to collect the people in the same village as her to give her some friends. I walk away as Shizu runs over to me. Th thank you for giving me this toy. I smile at her and rub her head before saying. It's no problem at all, little one. I then walk a little bit away from her and turn into my burb form before flying away. Of course, this was only theatrics, as the second I'm out of their line of sight, I teleport into my manor. I've got some daughters to rename. Chapter 47 Renaming and Heists I teleport into the manor and come upon a scene I never imagined possible. Rami, Ares, Gaia, and Undyne are all asleep and cuddling each other. Oh my god. So cute. Using creation magic, I create a Polaroid camera and start taking pictures. I take a few hundred pictures and decide to just let the girls sleep. I walk over to Rami and say. Ramil. Instantly, an egg grows around her. I guess she's evolving. I walk over to Ares and say. Ares. An egg grows around her as well. I walk over to Gaia. Gaia. Then, I get to Undyne. Undyne. With the three babies evolving, I move on to the flying whale and fox. Kale, Jeff. The two small creatures who are cuddling each other get put into eggs as well. These evolutions may take some time, so I leave my dimension. I return and tell Lucy to come back. She's been a loyal little devil, so I need to make her stronger as well. Her portal to hell opens in front of my throne and little Lucy walks out. Yes, Lady Sarah? I teleport in front of her and take her into my dimension. I then say. I'm renewing your name. I want you to be as strong as possible. Lucifer. As I say her name, something grows and hatches inside her, causing her to become a demon lord. Her magic in count swells to well over 40 B, causing her to become the second strongest demon lord behind me alone. She looks at me with stars in her eyes and says. Lady Sarah. I shall serve you for all eternity. I shall go and hunt you down the strongest beings in the world to sate your eternal hunger. She's about to portal out before I yank her back and yell. Wait. I don't need you to hunt for me anymore. Nothing in that world will be enough to make me much stronger. Now, I need you to take care of hell for me. You're the only person for the job. I know you'll do perfectly as the Queen of Hell. Note, Lucifer has acquired title, Queen of Hell. Hey. Now I'm making titles. I'm getting more and more godly with each day. I look at Lucy, who is currently shaking with excitement. I hear what sounds like a car engine revving up slowly. Ma. Lady Seraph I shall do my duty with the utmost care. 
Levite to me. She goes back to her land, presumably, and answers to everything there that she's the new ruler. Hey, she's pretty adorable. Scary too. But still adorable. I look around paradise, and feel that the city has grown too large. I'll have to do something about it soon. I have some ideas for what to do. Let's just say I've always been a fan of sci-fi. I go back out of my dimension into my throne room and look over towards Tempest. Seems Ramayu is fighting the ogres now. I teleport over there and watch the fight. I always felt that Rimayu was a bit too arrogant during this fight. I mean, if he had actually tried to kill him, I guarantee you Hakaru could have. Rimayu is one of the people who are the very definition of plot armor, but wait. Pfft. The fight ends the same as in canon, and I feel bad as I look at Kurobe. The friendly giant was always forgotten. They literally made a side story about him being lonely, dude. I feel like the author could have done a lot more with him. I mean, he has all the trademarks of the kind quiet character who just happens to be a berserker when they fight. Honestly, while they may not be too attractive as ogres, I still want Shin to step on me. Too bad she's a major simp. Benamayu is as chayuni as ever, same with Suai. And there's the other unfortunate simp, the cute as fuck Shuna. Ha. Huh. Why do the cute ones always simp for the femboys? I could be a femboy if I wanted you know? Ah. I'm getting sidetracked again. I look over and see Hakaru staring at me after their fight ends, hey. I look back at him, and we have a staring contest before he finally shrugs and looks away. Hey, gotcha bitch. You looked away first, so therefore I'm the alpha. Wait, no I'm a sigma. I feel like my chin just grew, the world turned black and white, and some more some music started playing. Weird. Anyways, I fly back towards Tempest and sit in wait. I wanna try the food. Of course, I'm gonna steal it from Rimuru. Who else would I steal from? The adorable gobby kids. Hell nah. I lay down in a branch and wait, and what do you know, that same goblin girl finds me again. She looks up at me and gets a big smile on her face before tugging her mom's arm. She points at me and says, Birdie is back. I fly down and land on a girl's shoulder. This time, her mom doesn't try to stop me. The girl smiles and puts her hand in a small bag on her waist, pulling out a few seeds. Or, she must have heard birds like eating seeds, so she's been keeping these with her. As I eat the seeds, I notice how she's already grown a little. It's only been a few weeks, yet she already looks a year older. Damn, gobbies grow fast. She was like four before, but now she looks five or even six. She watches me eat the seeds with a big smile, before someone shouts. Lord Rimayu has returned. Her mother takes her hand and starts leading her to greet him. I fly off onto the room of a nearby hut, and the girl looks at me while walking away, waving at me. I sit in wait on the hut. Hikari looks at me again, once again challenging my sigma nature. This time I squint at him slightly, intimidating him. He chuckles and looks away. I win again bitch. I see a few hobby gobbies setting up a chair for Rimoyu to sit in. It's almost time for the great theft. I'm gonna steal the skewer before he can even bite. It'll be glorious. People will remember this as the day they almost caught, demon. Lord. Sarah. Well, they would, if someone hadn't brought out a small chunk of Magisteel and got me distracted. As I look at the glowing stone, I hear Imoyu's mating call. I tease cooed. Ha ha ha. Exclamation mark. Damn it. I fly over and wink the remaining skewer off the plate, much to the chagrin of the surrounding hobby gob eyes. Rimoyu watches as I fly off onto a nearby room and begin eating the meat. Holy shit. This is mediocre. Honestly. The chefs in my kingdom make better stuff than this on the daily. Ha ha. Damn it. I guess Tempest hasn't really developed really good food yet. I fly over to Rimoyu again and drop the skewers back onto his plate. Man, I was looking forward to that too. Chapter 48 Phoenix God of the Abyss. Since I got some time till the orc thing happens, I decide to experiment on something I've been thinking of. I teleport out into the void. I curl into a fetal pose and try something. I take some magic eels out of my body. The reactor and my system instantly recover the energy. Then, I force the magic eels back into my body. Instantly, I feel a piercing pain in my body. Warning, circulating magic eels without a proper method will result in immense pain, and possibly death. Hey, that doesn't scare me. I'm a mortal bitch. I continue forcing the mana into my body and feel myself being ripped apart from the inside out. However, even though I'm dying, I feel so fucking strong. Ability gained. Sacrificial cultivation, a method of cultivating power exclusive to those who are unaffected by death. 
Magic Yules gained, 2050-700-10,000. As the Magic Yules run rampant in my body, I suddenly feel something in my body snap. My entire body is covered in flames, and I start turning to ash. You died. Dot. Dot. So, it seems my calculations were incorrect. I adjust a fake pair of glasses as my soul travels at many times the speed of light, back towards Tenshira. I thought I could take more punishment, but apparently not. Damn, that's more dangerous than I thought. How many did I get? Magic Yules gained, 735,085, 98,864,725,189. Damn. That really wasn't worth it. Ha. Huh. I feel like I've been sighing a lot recently. Maybe Q's cannon is boring when you're actually strong. Abyssal Star Devourer cooldown has reset. Exclamation mark. Houston, we have a poggers. Remind me never to say that again. Anyways, it seems my death made the cooldown end. Talk about plot armor. I'm not gonna go absorb the first star I see though. I wanna get another O class absorbed. That's really the only one worth it. Wait. Why would I be limited to stars? Why can't I absorb a black hole? I mean, I have creation magic and everything. My brain goes into overdrive, coming up with all the different possible methods I could use to absorb the energy from a black hole. My current thought is to somehow take the photon ring of the hold and use it to slowly but surely pull all the energy from it to fuel me. Similar to a Penrose sphere, but instead of bouncing the radiation back and forth, I absorb it into my body. I mean, my body is basically a Dyson sphere already. Just gotta repurpose some of the ability. I finally arrive at my destination, a burned down village. Yeah, faith in humanity ruined again. I absorb all of the pure souls and send them to paradise while sending the impure owns to hell. I teleport back into space and look around for a black hole. They're significantly harder to find, you know, cues their black in the void of space. But, using the inherent radiation radar I have, I find one after just a few hours of searching. It's pretty small. About the size of Pluto. Perfect to test my theory on. I get into orbit around the black hole and start the process. Using gravity magic, I turn myself into something of a black hole as well. Light starts bending around me as my body grows more and more dense with each second. I eventually overtake the black hole by 10%. I don't want to go too high in case it starts moving towards me. I start feeling the hawking radiation coming from the black hole as its photon ring starts circling around me. After the photon ring completely circles me, the black hole and I look like the number 8. Immediately. I feel power welling up inside me once again. Nothing could ever compare to this. This. Feeling of ecstasy. My entire body shudders as I feel the power building. My muscles tense up, and every magic in my body gets excited. I open my eyes and see the most beautiful array of colors. They pass by my eyes at incredible speed. All the stars that were around me, all the galaxies I could see in the distance, everything. Absolutely everything turns into lines of color, blasting by me at the speed of light. It feels like I'm watching something unfathomable, yet beautiful. Like the creation of a universe. I feel that lump inside my chest grow and grow, until something cracks. The second this lump breaks, a shell starts to encase my body. Evolving. This time I wasn't knocked out for my evolution. I can actively feel the changes to my body. My previous eight wings, eight individual wings, four sets. Stop asking, become just two. But... These two wings, are made entirely of black holes, and seem to span for all of space and time. The halo above my head becomes an actual black hole, sucking all light around it in. My skin grows even darker, blending in with the void itself. My feathers start to emit black flames constantly. I feel my understanding of multiple things grow. I know why I was reincarnated. I know why I was unable to cross dimensions. I know why I died when using that cultivation method. While I may know a lot of things I didn't before, I wouldn't say I'm omniscient. Nowhere near it. I feel my realm, paradise, start to change. The city grows further and further, until finally, it starts to morph. The previously flat city starts to turn spherical, becoming an ecumenopolis. A star forms at the perfect distance from the planet. Several other planets form around this star, each once being different types of livable planets. An ocean planet, a desert planet, a jungle planet, a planet with all different types of biomes. They all orbit around the star at the same distance. Then, other star systems begin to form. Thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, hundreds of millions. With each system, I feel myself growing stronger. 
eventually, an entire galaxy forms inside my dimension. As the galaxy forms, I feel my egg crack. Congratulations on reaching 100 B Magicules. Congratulations on becoming a demigod. Magicules gained 239,913,425,338,823,338,614. Congratulations on evolving. You are now an Abyssal Phoenix God. Title gained, Phoenix God of the Abyss. You now have the ability to teleport through dimensions. Chapter 49, How Big Am I? I can move again. I unfurl my wings and instantly break the shell around me. My wings, go on forever, further than the human eye can comprehend. They also have the same properties as a black hole, though for now I don't have them active, so it's just aesthetic for now, same with the halo on my head. How big am I now? Showing status. Status. Name, Saragarath Dolisarov, Mama, Mommy, plus six. Race Abyssal Phoenix God. Class. Titan Demigod, True Dragon, True Demon Lord. Rank, Z. Titles, Phoenix God of the Abyss, Demon Lord of the Abyssal Plain, Creator of Magic. Wingspan, 573 km to 754,832 km. Height, 103 km to 18,684 km. Magicules, 98,963,990,104-338,823,338,614. Dash. H. Humanu? That's like. Twice the distance to the moon. Oh? Oh oh? I can sense the barrier between dimensions now. It's like a giant sphere surrounding the multiverse. The universes all have a giant sphere surrounding them too. The barrier feels like a balloon. It's kinda neat. I can sense everything in this dimension if I focus. I can also sense the mini dimensions built into this one. I can sense the place those gross angels come from, the one with the big bugs, and pretty much everything else. Once the big war starts, I'll probably just destroy their dimensions. I feel like I could just make a gigantic black hole swallow up their dimensions. May. I don't feel like it right now. I can finally sense what was at the center of the galaxy. It seems to be the sole remnants of an incredibly strong being. Most likely Veldeneva. Seems like Rudru is just a weak dumbass. All Veldi most definitely wouldn't want his angels slaughtering humans, that's the demon lord's jobs. It's crazy though, it's just a remnant of his soul and yet it's still at least ten times my strength or more. Yeah, there's no way that little slime would ever be Veldeneva's equal sadly. I think the books downplayed his strength quite a bit. Guy literally created a multiverse. I shrink down to my presentable size and teleport back into my room. It seems it's been about a week since my evolution and the Orc Lord is currently walking around with his army. I suppose it's about time for Milam to get all excited about him. I swear though, if he treats her like a pet, I might take away his human form. Only I can treat her like that. I'll just sleep through the whole arc of him teaching the kids. That shit was boring as hell. But anyway, I teleport over to the Orc Lord and read its magic ill level. Right now. It's mid-A rank. Probably evolves into high A when it becomes an actual demon lord seed. Yeah, the orc disaster never became an actual demon lord, he just had the potential to become one eventually. He never met the human soul requirement, and he most definitely wasn't strong enough to ignore the requirement like Lucy was. That one magin that made him is pretty pathetic. He's just barely high A rank. The orcs individually are about C rank, together they're probably an A rank threat, so not too strong. The orcs are on their disgusting endless march, munching on the corpses of their fallen. They've just entered into Lizardman territory, which means I'll probably encounter my least favorite character. Honestly, if I were reincarnated as Rimuru, that obnoxious lizard would have lost his head. After about an hour, the Lizardmen start to come out to fight. They very quickly realize that this is a mistake after a few Lizzies get eaten. Then, the big show arrives. Rimuru and co arrive and start exterminators. The filthy orc xenos are being purged in holy fur. Ahem, sorry I don't know what got into me there. I sense all the orcish souls leaving the bodies and start collecting them. The orcs have rather pure souls despite their current actions, making this whole battle feel a little more heartbreaking. The battle progresses, Rimuru slaps the plague doctor around. Hey, maybe I should make myself a plague doctor mask to wear around. You know? Cuz I was a crow? Anaho, Rimuru and the Orc Lord of their eating contest which Rimuru wins. 
I take a couple orc corpses because I want to experiment before heading off to my next dimension. I bet Clayman is losing his shit right now hey. Oh yeah, that reminds me, I've got to put my demon lord ring back on. I took it off because of how obnoxious Clayman is. I put it on and say. Oi, anyone hear me? I hear Milam say. Yeah. Guy says. MHM. And the rest of them answer as well, except Clayman, Frey, and Lion Man. I forgot his name. Ah, Carrion. I say. Yeah, I woke up from my nap for good now. So next time there's a Warpagi I'm available. Guy just says alright, while Milam acts happy. The others share Guy's sentiment. Well, except for Ramirez. What made you think you could just disappear on us, huh? I ought to teach you a lesson. I chuckle at her reaction and just go on my way. Since Rimoyu is already done with this boring fight, I decide to go absorb a black hole. I choose one slightly bigger than the one I evolved with. I think this thing has about 19 times the gravity of the sun. Still pretty small for a black hole. I open my wings to their full glory and wrap around the black hole. My wings rapidly absorb the energy from the black hole, shrinking the already tiny thing even more. Soon, the entire thing gets absorbed. Stellar black hole absorbed. Magic yours gained, 46,392,949,685,126,288,283. Wingspan, 754,832 km to 781,390 km. Height, 18,684 km to 23,623 km. I swear I'm gonna end up becoming a mesh from Gurren Lagan at this point. Chapter 50, Demon Lords are scary. After absorbing the black hole, I feel like I just had a big meal. Like I literally can't eat anything else or I'll throw up. Phew, that hit the spot. I teleport back to my temple and wait for Milim to go off towards Tempest. It doesn't take long after the Orc Lord's death for Milim to find out about the slime and think it might be fun to go see it. I feel her flying over, so I teleport over there first in Smilborb form. Rimmer you managed to sense her a little while after, and ran off into the wilderness on a hill to avoid her going into Tempest. Milim lands with a bang and does her little I'm the Demon Lord Milim Narva thing. The ogres come and ignore Rimmer you because Plot and Milim starts getting excited. She's about to start fighting Rimoyu before I turn into my human form and say. All right Milim, you've had your fun. Everyone looks over at me as I'm a woman sitting on a tree branch, casually talking to a demon lord. Or. Not fair, Sarah, we're not supposed to interfere with each other. I chuckle and say. I'm not interfering at all, Milim. These guys aren't able to fight you. I tune into Rimoyu's convo with Great Sage. Great Sage, what is she? Rude. I do not know, though, it is likely that this individual is somehow completely hiding their magicules. Hey, Great Sage doesn't seem so great after gaining all this knowledge. It would feel like more of an assistant. I'm not copying it just yet, as I have an idea for during Wall Piggies where I'll mass copy everyone's skills. Dunno if I'll actually do this as most Demon Lord skills are useless now that I've got creation magic. Milim says. MMM, not fair. You'll have to fight me again then. I'll win this time. I smile and teleport to her before patting her head. All right, dear. We'll do it after the next Warpagis. Milam nods her head with a wide smile. Then, I hear him or you ask. Erm, um, who are you? I look towards him and say. I'm also a demon lord. I hear him or you's thoughts. T2 demon lords, why are they here? I say. I'm here because little Milam here flew over. I came to make sure she didn't cause trouble. Also, yes. Two demon lords. He freezes and thinks. Did she just read my mind? I chuckle and say. Indeed I did. It's a spell I created. It only works on beings below 10b magicules. I then take Milim's hand and lead her towards the city. Since it's developed a lot, I assume they'll start having some traditionally Japanese food, and spices. Honestly, I want some ramen and sushi. Though, honestly, I like Chinese food more than Japanese food. I just feel that it is stronger flavors, and me with my previously American brain, strong flavors equals good. Rimoyu stops me as I start walking towards the town and asks. Would you mind answering a question for me? I turn around and say. Depends on the question. He nods and say. Why are you walking to our town? I laugh and say. Because I want to, why else? 
me and Milam then keep walking as Rima you just sighs and walks with us, before saying. All right, but you have to promise me a few things. First, don't war. I interrupt him. All right, let me stop you there. You seem to have a sort of naivety to you. So, let me get this straight. Milam and I are demon lords. You understand this right? And not the ones who claim the name, true demon lords. While this may seem unfair, or even relatively barbaric to you, Milam and I would have no problem completely wiping your town off the map along with every single individual you've met. Not saying we will do that, just that we could. All right, with that out of the way, let's revisit what you just said. I smile at him with a slightly threatening smile. While I may be relatively placid, I won't stand for someone to command me to do anything. If he had asked me politely I may have agreed to whatever he would ask, but an ant doesn't command Godzilla to not walk over its nest. I wouldn't expect something like Veldenova to listen to me either. Shun gets an angry look on her face and is about to yell at me before Imoyu puts his hand up. As much as I hate to say it, you are indeed right. It's like an ant trying to tell Gojira what to do. Hey, now I feel like the slime is reading my mind. Shin and Milim get confused and say. Gojira? Rimoyu says. Ah, ignore that. I laugh and say. Indeed, that is quite an apt comparison. Rimoyu gets confused and asks. Wait, you know what Gojira is? I laugh and say. Another good comparison would be Yamka to Super Saiyan God Goku. Rimoyu's face gets more confused and says in his mind. Wait, is this person reincarnated too? I laugh and say. Indeed I am, though, it's been so long that I can't even remember my name from before. With that, I leave the confused Rimuryu on his own to think for a while and take Milam to a few places to eat. I get her a jar of honey, because I know how much she loved it in the story. I also teach her one of my favorite uses of honey, putting them on warm rolls. You know, it almost doesn't feel right if the roll isn't thrown at you. If you get that reference you get 10 points answer in the author notes for the non-rural US. Milam loves the snack, and eats while we walk. We stop at one of the places that sells shrimp tempura. Honestly, Cajun fried shrimp is pretty hard to beat. This is good, and definitely the best I've had in hundreds of millions of years, but Cajun is just so hard to beat. I'll have to teach a few people in my city about Cajun food. After finishing that, Milam and I get some ramen. Now ramen, I love. As a college-age student with an unpayable amount of debt, ramen was my lifeline. Personally, my favorite types of ramen were the ones with thicker noodles. I just felt like they held more flavor. Milim wasn't too big a fan of these two, as she has more of a sweet tooth. I'll have to take her to a pastry shop in Abyssia. Overall, it's pretty nostalgic having food that comforted me during the worst time of my life. Though, I don't really see it as that bad anymore. Mostly because I don't remember it much. While Milim and I are sitting on a bench, having some ice cream, Rimayu comes up to us with Ranga. Before he can even speak, Milam speaks up. So, Mr. Slime, are you trying to become a demon lord? He just shakes his head and says. Nope. I'm Rimmer you by the way. Milam gets confused and says. But being a demon lord is fun. People also respect you and stuff. You also get cool. I said I won't. Well, how do you have fun then? Well, I have a lot of things to do. I'm busy most of the time. Really? You get to boss monsters around and have fights with strong people. That sounds boring. Milim and I both gasp. Of course, I do it because I knew Milim would do it, but nobody except me will get that joke. I made myself chuckle though. Milim then grabs Rimmer you by the shoulders and shakes him before saying. Not fair. You're having more fun than a demon lord? Let me join too. Rimmer you looks at me, almost like he's expecting me to do something but I say. Nah. That last time was cues I was bored. You can deal with this. I stand up and say to Milim. All right Milim, come visit me sometime, I'll take you to a few pastry shops. I then use creation magic and make a time stopping spell. It stops time for the people of Tempest. I teleport to Rimuryu, who I kept unfrozen, and give him a warning. I'd avoid going into an onsen with Milim, Satoru Mikami. I will know. If you do that, you can say goodbye to that human form of yours. Rimuryu freezes and asks Great Sage. Gee Great Sage, what did she do? She has stopped T. I stopped time. Yes Great Sage. Astounding observation. Let me say this. I have no issue whatsoever with you living your life as you please, but Milim is off limits. You will treat her with respect, or you will face the consequences. 
Follow that, and we can be friends. I unfreeze time, and Milim feels that something is wrong, but just chooses to ignore it. I hear Imoyu's thoughts once again. Huyuyu, demon lords are scary, 